Mr. City Clerk, are we ready to roll? We're ready. I'll call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Duran? Here. Councilmember McReynolds? Here. Councilmember Johnson? Here. Councilmember Alter? Here. Councilmember Campos? Here. Deputy Mayor Dr. Sanchez Palacios? Here. Here. Mayor Schrader? Here. Seven members present. We're doing a quorum. Thanks. Mr. Johnson, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? It would be my pleasure. That was really good, Council Member Johnson, but you know the girls, the eight and under all-star team, might have to beat on that one, so from, from last week. Special presentations and announcements. The Ark of the Turk County's 70th anniversary. Founded in August 1954 in Santa Paula, the Ark began as a vision for a more inclusive society where individuals with intellectual and development disabilities, known as IDD, could live full lives and participate in their communities. Over the past 70 years, they've grown into a vital organization serving thousands of individuals and their families across Ventura County. The ARC is dedicated to empowering people with IDD to achieve their goals. Today, they provide services to over 650 individuals and employ 220 Ventura County residents. They work compassionately to ensure that everyone served can live with dignity, independence, and the opportunity to contribute to society. Our mission centers on recognizing the unique strengths and abilities of each person they serve. They are committed to fostering respect, independence, and self-determination, while also addressing the barriers that individuals with IDD face. We honor their empathy and service as they strive for a more inclusive and equal community within our city and county. As we mark this milestone, we are assured that the ARC will continue to innovate and expand its services to meet the evolving needs of our community, ensuring that every person with IDD has the opportunity to thrive. I, Joe Schreer, Mayor of Ventura, and on behalf of the entire City Council, want to heartily thank everyone who has contributed to this journey. Staff, volunteers, board members, partners, families, and especially the individuals served. Here's to 70 years of empowerment and inclusion and to many more years of positive impact. Thank you. Here to accept the proclamation, we have Esther Anaya and Alicia Gomez. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for what you do. It's fabulous. Okay. I can have you right here. Okay. You can hold this. Thanks so much. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, please. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and fellow council members. I am Esther Anaya, Director, Executive Director of the ARC of Ventura County. On behalf of the ARC of Ventura County, thank you for this proclamation honoring our 70th anniversary of empowering individuals with IDD. I was joined today by Steve Romero, Carly Brockman, Gary Schwartz, and Alicia Gomez. 70 years ago, parents challenged the system. They challenged the system to be inclusive of all people. It is because of these parents that Steve and Carly stood before you today as contributing members and residents of Ventura. Both Carly and Steve live independently in the city of Ventura, and it is because of the support of our dedicated direct support professionals 
Also to be present today, Alicia Gomez and Gary Schwartz. The individuals living with IDD are able to be contributing members of their cities and of society. On behalf of the ARC of Ventura County, we proudly accept this proclamation. It is uh, an honor, I didn't realize this, my birthday was in, is in August in 1954, so it's an honor to share my birthday with the founding of ARC. There would be no better birthday present for me. Thank you. Closed session report, Mr. Hogan. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. The City Council met in closed session tonight for the items listed on the agenda, and there is no reportable action. Thank you. City Council communication. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Can we have my slide, please? I apologize, Council Member. We didn't receive it. Oh, no. Seriously? If you said everything else, I'll line up on my own. Other city council communications? Um, I'll fill in some space. I went to the Cornhole tournament, and I think I saw a couple other city council members there. And uh, talk about the innovative spirit of uh, the city of Ventura. The owner of Spencer McKenzie's starts a tournament with 24 people, I think 14 years ago. And when I walked into the county fairgrounds, there were 1,088 two-person teams from all across the United States and even people from Europe. I, uh, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. It was an amazing group of people. They had a flyby. Uh, and uh, they were proudly wearing their team shirts, and they were there to win. Um, they were also there to have a good time. And it was a bunch of just, uh, I, I guess, just kind of great Americans um, inventing a sport and having the most fun possible. So my hat goes off to anyone and everyone who was involved with that cornhole tournament. It's the largest cornhole tournament in the world. Wow. Oh, yeah. Councilmember Johnson, can you can you beat that one? <laughs> uh, instead, I'm just going to talk about events that are going to happen, if that's all right. And I am going to see what I can do to print out some copies of this to have that I'll put out there um, because there's a lot of events that I have coming up. And so, all right, let's start with this Wednesday at 7 p.m. The College Area Community Council will be having its monthly meeting. Um, I, Sabrina Rodriguez and, people, and uh, Dr. Castro from the, the school board and the school district are going to be there to talk in part about ballot measures. I'll be there to talk about things. This is a Zoom meeting and the agenda and the Zoom link are available at caccventura.com. I wanna take a moment before I go on and, and while I still have a soapbox, I wanna thank staff for all their work with the with the community councils for showing up for really being letting the community councils be that conduit but in particular mayor i want to thank the police department for really having somebody there at every meeting of every community council meeting every month when i first got involved in local issues that was not the case and in fact that is why i got involved in local issues was because there was a very big disconnect between the police department and the residents. And so now, you know, we're at a point where I think we all take for granted that when you go to a community council meeting that the police are going to be there and they're going to talk about the trends in your neighborhood and they're going to be there to answer the questions. I, I want everybody to understand that I do not take that for granted. It was an intentional choice and it's not a simple thing for a department to be sending people to meetings all the time and you and so I'm grateful to everybody who has been involved on that. Okay, so that's Wednesday, that's tomorrow. Next Thursday, 
It's August 29th at 3 p.m. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not next Thursday. That's two days from now. Thursday, August 29th, on Thursday, 3 p.m., uh, I will be at Pete's Coffee at 1171 South Victoria. If you're on my mailing list, you saw that that was rescheduled. We had to reschedule it. So it will be this Thursday, 3 p.m., Pete's Coffee. Thursday, September 5th, 9 a.m., breakfast at Hill Street Cafe. That's over there by the Government Center on Hill Road. And then Saturday, September 7th, 7 p.m., at the uh, little restaurant there, I forget what they call it, Green Olive or something, inside Santa Cruz Market in 1947, East Bank. Uh, because I have so many obligations on the weekends now, there will not be a second Saturday cleanup in September. And I will see what I can do to print out some copies of this, because I know it's hard for people to take it all down. You can always find me on Facebook or Instagram, <coughs> Mike from Ventura, they're there. Or you can always text me at 805. 515 6839. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Campos. Hello. First, thank you, Mayor. First off, I'd like to remind um, the community that the Westside Community Council meets not tomorrow, but the following Wednesday at the Lords. Um, and we have a great meeting coming up this September, so I encourage everybody to attend and find out what a great community council does. Um, the other thing I want to mention tonight, I received a, a lot of email and uh, social media, media posts this weekend um, making negative statements about some city staff members. And it was upsetting to me because I know those comments to be not true. And so uh, some of the people who emailed, maybe here in the room tonight, I know there's an item you all want to speak on, but I would ask you to be kind to the staff. None of them is going out on their own and making plans. They're hardworking and they work at the direction of the council. So please remember that when you're speaking tonight. Thank you. Other communications for other city council members? If not, we'll go to city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before I start with my comments, I wanted to acknowledge an oversight regarding the posting of the Spanish version of tonight's agenda. Unfortunately, it was not made available last week alongside the English agenda. Uh, once the issue was corrected and the agenda was posted on Monday, our staff promptly contacted Spanish language stakeholders in the community uh, to ensure they were fully informed and had access to tonight's uh, city council business details. And we recognize the importance of ensuring that everyone in our community has access to crucial information and sincerely apologize for the inconveniences this has caused. I uh, want to remind the public that the um, state of the city address will be delivered by Mayor Joe Schrader on Thursday, September 19th. This is an annual event hosted by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this year it will be at the Crown Plaza from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. The presentation is a ticketed event and will provide an overview of the city's budget, department updates and accomplishments, goals for the future and much more. The public is invited to live stream the presentation on the city's YouTube channel or attend an abbreviated version at the city council meeting scheduled for October 8th. You can visit the city's website to view past presentations or check out this year's presentation, which will be available in late September. The city is proud to share the launch of Ventura Connects, our new online portal that makes it easier for residents to report issues like potholes, graffiti, debris, and much more. You can submit requests from your smartphone, tablet, or computer anytime and from anywhere. With real-time updates, photo and video uploads, multi-language capabilities, and GPS tagged locations, Ventura Connects ensures service requests are handled quickly and accurately. The public can also track the progress of requests with just a few taps and then submit them anonymously if so desired. The application is available and download in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. And to learn more about Ventura Connects, please visit the city's website. 
The next meeting of the City Council will be on Tuesday, September 10th. The September 24th meeting is tentatively canceled, uh, and the next meeting following will be on October 8th. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Moving on to consent items. There are 11 consent items on the agenda tonight for consideration. Are there questions, comments, or requests to have an item pulled? Mr. McReynolds. Uh, I'd like to request that item 3 be pulled. Item 3 be pulled. Mr. Halter. Uh, Mr. McReynolds already did it for me, so thank you. Any others? So we will pull three and I'm open. Excuse me, I need to go to public comments. I almost forgot that. <laughs> On the consent items, all consent items uh, besides item three. Yes. We have one public comment, uh, Glenn Overly, who's been seated time by uh, two different individuals. So you'll have nine minutes. On which item, please? Which, which item? Uh, item four. Mr. Mayor, sorry that I missed your birthday. I wish I would have known. You haven't missed my birthday. It's actually the 29th, so. Maybe we can do golf. I will be looking for your birthday card in the mail. You shall have it. From both you and Patty, I hope. Absolutely. Thanks. Goes without saying. Miles, I'm glad you're feeling better. Tonight I want to, my name is Glenn Overly, by the way, and tonight I want to oppose consent item number four. And the reason why I want to do this, I'll explain. So how did we get here? As I recall, Council Member Johnson made comments about the purchase of medical benefits from the city. Basically, his monthly stipend of 600 did not cover the cost of medical. So ultimately, it was costing him money to be a council member and pay for medical coverage from the city. Somehow that morphed into this policy consideration. On July 16th, staff presented council with a chart that listed 18 separate cities. The chart will be appearing in just a minute. The chart looks pretty much straightforward, but there's a twist. Of the 18 cities listed, 61% of those cities are charter cities just like us. The other 39% are general law cities. This seems like apples to oranges comparison and perhaps a little misleading. I hope council was aware of that. As another observation of this chart, it is interesting that for the most part, with the exception of Oxnard and Costa Mesa, the highest general fund budget cities are charter cities just like us. The only charter city listed with a lower general fund budget than Ventura is Redondo Beach. By the way, that's where I grew up. The charter city most comparable to Ventura was a general fund budget and the number of employees similar to Ventura is San Mateo. San Mateo is located in San, on the San Francisco Peninsula and the cost of living in this charter city is 169% of the national average. I'm not certain of the condition of its infrastructure, but I suspect it's better than the condition of Ventura. It, it is, is also important to understand that the median household income of San Mateo is slightly above 149,000 while the tour is slightly about 96,000. That person is not with me. This is significant, and it also of note that according to the chart, San Mateo still pays its council members $600 a month. What is the cost of the policy change before council? According to city documents, the price of this policy at the high end will be over $91,000 per year if all seven council members select the highest projected family policy. This is not about this council. It is about the impact on future councils. These numbers are not going to break the bank, but there are some considerations. 
First, council members are elected officials, not full-time employees. Number two, the health benefits you are requesting for yourselves are part of a benefit package for full-time supervisor level employees that were negotiated in good faith by the union for full-time staff members with a rank of supervisor of above. Number three, full-time line employees do not receive these dollar amounts towards their insurance. They must pay out of pocket for themselves and their family. Number four, the union did not negotiate these health benefits with any understanding that the council would be included in any of these groups. Number five, council members enriching themselves without voter approval goes against the common interest of the citizens who elected them, and it's not the spirit of our charter. Can council appreciate the message that you are sending to the line staff members of the city who must pay full vote for their health insurance on income levels that are considered low for the industry? I have spoken to several line employees that describe the city insurance benefits as inferior to other cities, including the county programs. How does council believe line employees will feel about council approving their own health benefits? Do you? Still not my friend. I apologize. We're having some issues. I'll try to figure it out. You can continue. No worries. Do you believe the union is going to appreciate these plans being used by council to line their pockets, even though elected officials are not full-time employees? Do you believe the approval of this policy will impact employees' morale? Do you think this might set a bad precedence for part-time employees' compensation in the future? In case you haven't figured it out, I am opposed to council enriching itself without a vote of the public. I believe strongly in democracy, and this flies in the face of those basic concepts. But even more egregious is the concept of providing med medical benefits does not serve all council members equally. I understand the mayor receiving more compensation than the other council members because of the charter language and the fact that the mayor clearly has more responsibilities than the rest of council. I do not support council on this policy as written because it will compensate council members at different rates. I do not think this was the intention of the city's charter. The only member according to the charter that should be compensated at a higher level is our mayor. This policy does not follow the spirit or the letter of our charter. How is this even possible? Since it costs the city money to provide medical coverage per this policy, it has a value attached to it. During the July 16th meeting, we learned that several council members will not utilize the benefits of this policy. So council members that do not elect to receive these benefits will receive financial compensation greater than her colleagues. Council members that have family members and take those benefits will be enriched more than a single member who elects to receive those same benefits. In closing, this policy was not thoroughly vetted and council did not carefully consider the inequities before making a decision that is counterintuitive to equal council compensation values. The easy solution to this policy was to increase the monthly stipend for council before the voters. That increase, if approved by the voters, would allow council members to continue to purchase their own medical through the city as currently allowed, independent of other council members. Compensation would be equal and in harmony with the charter. And so just as an example, and I've covered this before with council, but it's important for the audience. Bill McReynolds may not accept the health benefits. He has an option, but he may not take them. But if council member Duran does take those, the fact that the city is paying those fees gives Councilman Duran more compensation than you get for serving in the same job. And that just is wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes public comments on unpolled consent items. I'll entertain a motion on consent items one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 and 11. I'll move to. 
Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote, please. We have a motion and a second. You can now wait your vote. Waiting on one vote. All votes have been entered. Seven eyes, or six, six eyes, and motion carries. On to consent item number three, the Hope uh, and Solutions Subcommittee Work Plan. Council Member McReynolds, I believe. Yeah, so I have uh, several questions for staff uh, on the, the work plan. Good evening. Thanks, Council Member Rachel Black, Community Development Director. We're available for any questions. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, my, my first question is I, I had brought forward the policy consideration regarding this. Um, on it. And, you know, thank you for your work in getting this over within the time frame. Um, I still have a variety of questions concerning the work plan. Uh, my first question, again, I just want to reiterate the point that uh, I don't think the name makes any sense. I can look at any uh, the agenda center and I can see basically I know what the planning commission does, design review committee, historic resources committee. I, I don't know what hope uh, and solutions does. And I just think we're doing a disservice to the residents uh, that want to be an active part of this. And I, I really think we should consider the uh, I don't know if the staff has any comments on that or, uh, or I can go. I, we do. I, I absolutely agree with that sentiment, that it is confusing. And I think specifically because all of our other committees, subcommittees, boards, and commissions are very clearly identified through their names. Um, and so we would recommend that this be the Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee of the City Council to keep it really simple. I think having the words housing and homelessness in the title are exactly what it is and would lend themselves to helping people to understand um, and I mean, we're happy to operate under any name, but I totally understand that this would help to clearly identify the subcommittee for the community. Okay, and then my next question is regarding uh, if the, what I'll continue to call the Hopes and Solutions Committee, we have, you, you, we get an allocation from the federal government, you get a lot of block grants and home funds, and then does that come before the Hopes and Solutions Committee before it comes before the full council for a recommendation? Yes, so the uh, Hope and Solutions Subcommittee would actually make the recommendations, review all the applications, interview the applicants, make a recommendation to City Council for final approval. Previously, staff was doing that um, portion of the review and then coming straight to City Council. So this would remove the staff review and just go straight to the subcommittee. And then would there, is there a timeline associated with that that facilitates with the budget process itself, yeah. knowing that we... Yes, thank you for the question, Councilmember McReynolds. So yes, so typically what ends up happening is that we do not receive our funding application until February or March of the new calendar year. However, we do start the application process three months in advance. So all of our um, contact lists who are interested in receiving, for example, community development block grant funding are then notified in December. We have like a web, uh, a web meeting and then we proceed with the application process. So. With our proposed application process for the new fiscal year, we do anticipate taking this item to the Hope to Solutions Subcommittee in February or March at the latest, and then also be coming to City Council in April and May, respectively. And then, so my question to that is, do we need to codify, to be fair to Mr. Morley and his team, in terms of putting the entire budget together, when that occurs with the Hope and Solutions Committee, or do you, as staff, is your recommendation just the new policy? Uh, the recommendation would be essentially the new policy because typically the Department of Health and Urban Development who releases the funding to us has a deadline in the month of May in which all allocation plans must be submitted to, to that, uh, that federal agency to ensure that we receive our allocation by the line first deadline. Okay, my next question is the staff report mentions that the Hopes and Solutions Committee has a role in white uh, reduction. And I don't know if, if that's true. And then how are they achieving that? Or is that just a mistake? So typically what blight reduction is in the description of the current subcommittee. Um, however, blight reduction in the two years I've been with the city has not came up at the Hope to Solutions Subcommittee meeting. 
And typically those types of issues are either initially addressed by our patrol task force and of course by Beautify and Maintain, which is also known as BAM through Parks and Recreation. Okay, and then in terms of going forward with uh, staying on the topic of BAM and the patrol task force, what role do they have in terms of attending the Hopes and Solutions Committee? Um, and like, how do we codify to make sure, I mean, my, and the, my context is, in, in my opinion, this is a city council subcommittee of three council members like all homeless activities, home housing should come under the auspices of this committee, regardless if it's in the police department, if it's in the uh, community development or parks and recreation, like it all should be under this one auspices. So what role, how does patrol task force and BAM roll into this? So um, historically, BAM has not attended um, the Hope and Solutions Subcommittee meeting, but we will, of course, extend that offer so they can talk about that blight reduction. The Patrol Task Force has typically, on and off for the last two years, uh, presented um, reports on vagrancy within the community. However, what we're planning to do moving forward to ensure that the subcommittee and the community members are aware of what's going on with our Patrol Task Force is allowing Sergeant Vasquez of the Patrol Task Force to essentially make a presentation at the beginning of the meeting so that he'll be able to provide all the necessary updates, be available for questioning. And then we can also ensure that we have a represent representative from BAM as well in the Parks and Rec Department. Okay, and then uh, going with the housing element, so there's gonna be the, there's an annual review of our progress towards achieving the housing, uh, what's in the housing element. So will this committee receive that report and make a recommendation to the full council or how does that go? So for the housing element, so we had we had to submit an annual progress report to the Department of Housing and Community Development by April 1st of each calendar year. So as we're making progress towards implementing the housing element before we do a submission to the state, we can bring that to Hopes and Solutions for the recommendation, uh, have them basically confirm that, you know, they're signing off on it. And then before we submit it ultimately to the state, we can bring that to support the city council. What would be the typical process? I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so the typical the typical process what we've been doing is that we basically compile data throughout the calendar year to be able to report back to the city to let them know in terms of what programs have been implemented, what programs are pending, and then also to the number of developments that are in progress, the ones that have been permitted, because we're trying to make sure that we're meeting our regional you know, housing number application, our reading numbers. So that's typically what we have done in the past. But in terms of making sure that our total solution here is about housing as well as homelessness issues, we want to ensure there's transparency at that committee so that we'll be able to share that information with them as well. So it won't be a hurdle for us to be able to submit, um, to review that, about that information with the subcommittee on members. And does it, is there any reason that it should come before the full council? The only thing that we'll be asking for, if it would come forward to the full council, we would be asking for an endorsement of the report and that we can make sure that we can submit it in a timely fashion before April 1st to the state next year. I, I think my preference would be to get a report. I understand that it could be after the timeline, but okay. yeah, here's, the, here's what's happened, here's what we've done. Here's yeah. Because typically what happens also in the rentals is that we submit the annual progress report to the state, the state um, reviews it, makes comments, and then they give us some approval saying that your, it has been submitted timely and you have been approved for this particular year's annual progress report. And then what we can do thereafter once we get that approval from the state is that we can then bring it to front of full council so that council will be aware of the number of initiatives that we have implemented as well as the number of housing units that we have been developing within the community to meet our renewal numbers. The governor just issued an executive order directing state agencies to start using state funding to clean up contaminants. And then and it's directed local jurisdictions to use state funding to do something similar. How does Hopes and Solutions fit into that uh, uh, edict from the governor? So um, thank you for that question. I, I think that the way that Hope and Solutions will fit into that is that any action that we take will be reported to Hope and Solutions and that any potential actions that the city is looking to take related to housing and homelessness would go before that um, subcommittee. In the case of this specific um, uh, edict from the state, um, the city and um, the the city has basically um, not changed our course of action. We assist with um, with the state agencies and their encampment removal, but we haven't changed our policies internally for how we operate our city um, 
on city land. If that were to potentially change or if we had potential changes to that policy, that would be something that would go before the subcommittee for review as well. And then uh, my last question is going to be uh, kind of three parts, is that we have the homeless, uh, homelessness prevention and diversion program, we have the felt all weather shelter program, and we have the mobile home uh, rehabilitation and loan program. Uh, all of these are listed under services that we do to prevent homelessness or under the that auspices. There's no mention in the work plan of those programs, but I would like to see if there are changes, these programs. Updates on these programs, but those would also come before the post solutions. We can absolutely do so. Effectively, those are within the other categories that were listed, so that's why they weren't specified and called out. But absolutely, those programs can be brought before the subcommittee for review and uh, status updates. Okay, that's kind of my question regarding the staff report. My last question is procedurally: How does this move forward if the council approves it tonight? The work plan does it come back as an ordinance or what's the procedure? What are the next steps? Yes, thank you for the question, Councilor Reynolds. Um, on a previous motion, Council made earlier this year, um, the one part that was uh, to be codified in the municipal code was the actual scope of this subcommittee. Uh, so in the staff report, there's listed the six areas um, here at the top of the staff report that the uh, subcommittee uh, would address. And so um, we would take those and uh, uh, create a section in the municipal code uh, that outlines, outlines those general subject matter areas um, for uh, the subcommittee as uh, that subcommittee's purview or work plan, if you will. So we would return with a, an ordinance on consent at a future meeting um, that codifies that for council approval. Thank you. Mr. Halter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, staff, for this report. And I want to mention that um, the, by far the number one issue facing the state and the city and probably the country is housing, whether that be uh, having enough housing, having affordable housing, which has gotten ridiculous, uh, to providing housing for the unhoused that are living on our streets and in our parks. And so I've been honored to serve on this committee uh, for the last two and a half years. And uh, we went from a safe and clean to hope, trying to present something a little more positive and safe and clean. Um, but I'm open to anything that's more descriptive. I wanted to just mention that. But uh, it is a big lift. There's a lot going on. And I respect that staff has a lot on their table. I want to mention, though, that from my recollection, and some of it is just terminology, I think, is where... Uh, we get bogged down. And I look at the fact that oftentimes because of the shortage of rooms at City Hall and the short time that we have to have our meeting in, we get a little rushed towards the end. So I want to just throw that out as possibly why some of this got a little bit confusing. Um, what was presented to us in the meeting um, in, in July was a tenant protection policy with a recommendation of doing a $500,000 outreach to, for an RFP for somebody to look at tenant protection uh, elements that may be included uh, as needed by the city of Ventura. Uh, I know, uh, I believe, I know it was my intent uh, as one of the two that uh, made the motion was to um, bring that back in house and have staff look at the, the different elements that make up tenant protection to see what's plausible, what's uh, needed, and what is desired by our city and um, by all the stakeholders in our community. Uh, whether they be um, those in house, whether they be people who are in need of services, uh, or people searching for that affordable housing, or whether it be property owners that are providing the housing. We need to hear from all stakeholders. And that was our direction, and that was a motion that passed that day. I uh, was uh, do, doing outreach um, led by city staff to do outreach to all, all the stakeholders. Um, I guess what I have. I question about is item number six and under the analysis of the work plan for this subcommittee, it's tenant protection policies. We're yet to develop those policies. So I guess that's just a category of saying tenant protection policies yet to be determined what those policies and what elements would be part of those policies, correct? That's correct. It effectively anything related to tenant protection would go before the subcommittee to be discussed and get recommendations before moving forward to city council. Okay. 
I think the part that confuses it a little bit is because of what's going to happen later tonight on item 13, because it looks like there's already a policy being considered without first going to all the stakeholders to see what's needed and what we would all support. And so I just want to throw that out as a concern, but I'll leave it up to my colleagues that sit on that on committee with me to see if they remember uh, that meeting differently than I do. Mr. Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, staff. Um, I just had a question. Well, first of all, the um, topics that we have, the six that you've listed on this report, are obviously all things that the committee is working on right now. But I wanted to get some clar clarification on uh, page four of the staff report towards the middle. It says, after deliberations, the subcommittee voted 3 0 to recommend that the city council approve the tenant protection work plan. Can, can you let me know what that work plan is? Sure. So I'd be happy to talk through the tenant protection work plan, but that's actually an agendized item for later in the evening. I know it relates to this specific work plan, but I don't want to get us too far into that direction. Um, do, do you want me to still answer or do you want to wait for the other item? Uh, I'll let me answer. The direction that we gave was basically for public outreach. That, that was the plan when we come back with that information. So um, I just want to make sure that we're not thinking that there's this, I mean, that was the first, the first thing that we needed to get done. So I just want to make sure that we're not, we don't have something already in place. We need to get all that information. So I see by your head nod that that's, it's okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I, just to clarify, because I know there are a lot of people in the room here tonight for that item, um, the, you know, the tenant protection um, plan that we're, uh, proposing is really the first step based on the conversation and the recommendation from the subcommittee. It was really to go back and engage with the community, as you said, to determine what those future steps are. So the basis of the program we'll talk about later tonight, but that was really the, the direction that we're moving in. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. McReynolds, followed by Council Member Campos. Uh, if she wanted to, I would. Okay, my question is a clarifying question uh, regarding, and we'll stay on the tenant protections topic, but it's not related to that. So, so I want to understand this. The housing element was approved by the HCD, and the authority on the recommendation of council is with the planning commission, regardless of it being under the Hopes and Solutions Committee, or how does that specifically work? And it could be any topic. I'm just going to fix so I think there was a little bit of confusion about what the housing element required. And I think there was confusion from staff's side as well in the past. So there may have been um, there have may have been confusion about how it was exactly laid out. And I don't have the housing element in front of me, I apologize. But effectively the housing element requested that the planning commission review um, some specific plans related to housing and homelessness. And I think the thought was that that would open up the planning commission to review all topics on homelessness. They already look at housing policy today, specifically when it relates to zone text amendments that create the housing policy or zoning ordinance. So, um, you know, if they, um, so really, you know, by selecting open solutions as the subcommittee that deals with these issues, there are certain things that legally are required to go to the planning commission when you amend the zoning ordinance, for example, or reviewing that one specific plan that was referenced in the housing element. But overall, most of these topics, particularly on the homelessness side, will fall to the subcommittee. Where there is overlap, we will go to planning commission first, then to the subcommittee, and then to city council. So recommendation from planning commission, rec to the council, recommendation from the subcommittee and council, and then a council final decision. But we would, we would allow both to review when there is overlap rather than only go to one. Thank you. Councilor Campos. I want to thank you all for all the work that you've done in the time I've been on this subcommittee. It's amazing what you've been able to accomplish in a very abbreviated time span in the meetings. I love the idea of a new name and the work plan, plan looks very solid to me. I think we need to really get on top of the space problem so that the meetings can progress smoothly and not be rushed at the end. And I know there's a lot of staff that will be involved in that, not just the, the HCs or the uh, community development staff. 
but I do want to share how hard you all work and thank you for that. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I just, just a point of privilege. Are we really trying to stick to questions or can I be making comments as well? Uh, let it fly. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I appreciate what you were saying, Ms. Diamond, about the housing element. I, I will note, and I just moved off the page, that, you know, it does say, for example, that tenant protection policies will be handled through public hearings at the Planning Commission. Um, and I'll find the timeline here. The um, It was supposed to come to council before now. And and I has, has the Planning Commission had any hearings on tenant protection policies? No. Thank you. And, and the last Planning Commission meeting was in April. Is that correct? I believe so. And we have another one scheduled for next week. Or I'm sorry, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. To, to respond to some of the questions you had about this. And you know that... I, I was I was at the meetings when they were there was the homelessness subcommittee. So ten years ago, twelve years ago, um, and so the reason we have some of this stuff about blight and ban. Here's what happened. So it was homelessness. Then it was homelessness and affordable housing, and then we had the safe and clean initiative, and that started off as blight, and then safe and clean 2.0 brought in homelessness. That was when we brought in Meredith Hart from the DVP to manage Safe and Clean. She was the Safe and Clean manager or director. And Meredith, Ms. Hart, uh, coordinated a lot of those things. This was somebody who I, as a resident, if it, was, if it was a mattress on the street, if it was somebody passed out in the bathroom at a park, those were all under her purview. So, so it was safe and clean, and then the committee made the unfortunate name change to safe and clean. Uh, the only people in favor of that were the three council members that were sitting on the subcommittee at the time. Um, and, and so what happened was we still have this, this committee, which is really a rebranded safe and clean committee, but what's happened, of course, since then is we no longer have safe and clean. Instead, we took homelessness and moved it into the community development department, and we took all the other stuff and put it in the Parks and Rec department under BAM, beautify and maintain. And the genesis for BAM, when it came up here and it was kind of just like, here's an idea for you guys to, to I haven't, we haven't figured out the details, we don't know how it worked, but you got to prove it. And it included a lot of work with homeless residents. Now, when I found out about the plan to compensate homeless people for cleaning up our streets with gift cards, I had a fit. And I said, we don't do that. We don't, we don't pay people in gift cards because they are homeless. And so the idea of the band bands going to the arch and picking up homeless, or at that point, sheltered residents so that they can clean the city streets for some minimum wage, that done. Okay, so... We now have a completely different setup in the city. When we talk about blight, when I was chair, Council Member Brown was adamant that we continue to have blight be within our purview. I opposed it, but the subcommittee was not going to get anywhere. Now we have this other issue, which is, well, frankly, you know, we had a prior city manager who very clearly, I, I mean, expressly told me, that he wanted to wind down the Safe and Clean Homes Subcommittee and have it go through the Planning Commission. And so we do have things like the tenant protections will be going to um, will be going to the Planning Commission on a regular basis. All of that is still up in the air. I, I bring this up because I'm not here, I'm not gonna be here when you all have to fix this. I don't know how we proceed tonight. We have to proceed tonight on some of this when they're, it sounds to me like, correct me if I'm wrong, but some members of that committee feel like the staff report does not reflect what they thought they were voting on. And I wish that had been cleared up before tonight. My last comment, Mayor, is, is one, and it's, and it's for everybody in the room that intends to make a comment, which is that the subcommittee 
is only three council members. It's, it, it advises the council. They don't have the power to pass anything. They don't have the power to veto anything. Um, ultimately, it is the city council's job to do these things. We can move forward with the other item. It's hard for me tonight with this without having some clarity on what did or did not happen at that meeting. Uh, those are my comments, Mayor. I'm, I'm at a loss tonight. Thank you. Mr. Hall. And thank you again, Mr. Mayor, thank you, staff. I just wanted to, uh, while we're able to give comments, wanted to mention for me, um, we all have our idiosyncrasies, a way of sol solving problems. And for me, they've worked fairly well in my life. And what I look at is things from a holistic standpoint. So what I need, and I know the information is out there, it's just in many different places. So it's looking at the type of housing that exists in our city, what that um, bell curve is from affordable to very unaffordable, okay, to, um, and, and then looking at the service providers that are providing focus on certain populations that are in need of affordable housing and some that may be uh, unhoused. And seeing what beds may be associated with or rooms may be associated with those populations and looking at the funding. So therefore, once you have, that's just a summary of what I see the big picture being and then figuring out the critical path so that we can actually have a dashboard that makes sense on how we are accomplishing the goal that we're trying to get to, which is uh, alleviating the need for anybody to ever live on our streets or in our parks and in our river bars and making sure that everyone has housing that's not substandard, okay? And uh, allowing the young people to stay put and continue spreading their roots in our community. And maybe so, in, do in doing so, you might find those businesses where 73% of our workforce can use outside Ventura for every single day, 27 and a half miles each direction, and try to bring those businesses back to our city because we have the housing that supports them, okay? Without that big picture and finding that critical path, it's very difficult for me to just throw a dart at that board and say, this is the solution and that's the solution. Because having lived as long as they have in the state of California and seeing so many well-intended policies and live to see all the unintended consequences, I definitely don't want to add to that. I want to find the solutions, and I feel a peace now. So that's what I'll keep begging for, and I'll keep trying to encourage us all to work together to get that big picture. The same goes with climate change. If we all knew what each one of us can do to be part of the solution, I believe we will solve it. But we have to all know what we can do. We have to break it down so we can figure out the critical path. That has worked for me my entire life. And I'm sure it's sure step like to bring it to the council as, as a way of solving problems and with the staff, with the help of city staff. So that's what I'm looking for. And I know we have all the information. And I know we're all eager to solve this problem, but I'm very afraid of making decisions in a vacuum. Councilor McReynolds. Uh, just a final clarifying question. Again, this is just dealing with the hopes and solutions. As staff, do you believe that if we were to approve this tonight, that all topics regarding homelessness from all departments, police, community development, parks and recreation, will be coming before this subject? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. If um, my colleagues have asked their questions, I'd like to move to uh, uh, for a vote. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I, I believe we need uh, public comment first. Oh, public comment. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Johnson, do you have comments or? I do have a comment. I, you know, um, I, I really appreciate everybody that has stepped up to serve on the, the homeless, I'm sorry, the HOPES subcommittee. Councilmember Campos, Councilmember Halter, and Councilmember Duran. Mayor, I hope you realize that you were probably the first mayor in history to have four people that were willing to serve on that at the same time. In the past, um, that has been, and I'm sure you can speak with some former mayors, one of the more difficult subcommittees to find people to serve on. And um, I think we also need to bear in mind that, you know, if we want it's true. Homelessness touches every department that we have. That does not necessarily mean that every department needs to be showing up at every every hopes meeting um, to explain what they're doing on that. Um, 
there has there has to be more clarity on this. And I will say this as somebody who was chairman of the Hopes Committee, and several times I was the only council member to show up for the meeting. It requires uh, tremendous engagement, involvement, and commitment by those members. And I, I will point out that, you know, we are talking about a hopes committee that would um, be, would have, you know, probably four or five times the workload of any of our other subcommittees. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. I look forward to hearing what the public has to say about this and um, hearing the, my comments, hearing my colleagues, other comments there. I apologize if I seem scatterminded. There's a lot here. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, Mayor, if I may uh, clarify um, on Councilmember Reynolds' question in regards to uh, what other departments with their involvement in regards to the task force or BAM, um, I think it would be appropriate for them to report maybe their kind of efforts to the, home, the HOPES and Solutions Committee, um, but not report in terms of get direction on their action, um, just to clarify, like kind of reporting what they are doing and maybe some statistics, but not necessarily taking direction in terms of their work plan. My, my concern is to Council Member uh, Halter's point that I want this committee to have a holistic approach to everything. I don't necessarily, if they're making decisions, not, that's not my point, is that they're getting the whole picture. And they're able to then make decisions, recommendations to the full council based on having that full picture so that I'm not asking the police department, parks and rec, come forward uh, on these items. Yes, absolutely. Understood. I just wanted to make sure that um, there wasn't a perceived uh, notion that Hopes and Solution would be directing control task force uh, daily efforts for our BAM. Um, uh, and I think Councilmember Johnson correctly points out that we don't need to have every department. Committee, you know, but, but if you do need them there, they will be there. Um, I believe people from Patrol Task Force absolutely, and our department head or manager of them um, could be present as requested. Yes. Thank you much. Public comments. Thank you, Mayor. We have received uh, email communications which have been posted online. We do currently have uh, nine speakers, but I anticipate that we could get uh, 15 or more as we go along. Um, and we are experiencing some audio issues on YouTube. So if you are uh, trying to access the movie on YouTube, please do uh, go to the city's website and access the uh, WebEx link. Okay, so as of right now, you have nine speaker cards on the site. As of right now, nine speaker cards. Okay, and once we start, then there's no more speaker cards? No, no uh, we accept speaker cards as we go along. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Let's get started in three minutes. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a clarification? And maybe the city attorney can. Because again, this is the hopes and solutions work plan. This is not the, the item coming forward as item 13, right? So just if, if people, if there are comments, I'll let the, you can clarify. Thank you, Councilor McReynolds. You read my mind. I just wanted to clarify for the public um, on this item. It is just voting to approve the subcommittee's work plan. And the work plan is just those six subject matter areas. It's not endorsing any particular policy or approach. It's just saying the subcommittee is gonna work on these six areas. And so we just wanna clarify that before um, public comment. I think the more substantive discussion will come on item 13 on you know how people feel about a particular issue. So just wanna um, lay that out before people make public comment on just the subcommittee work plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Mr. Sir, you can proceed. Our first speaker is Gina Bush, followed by Pat Newman. You each have three minutes. Uh, is that Gina? Okay. Uh, Pat Newman, followed by Adele Trader. I'm Pat Lee Venture, I'm from the County Coastal Association of Realtors. I actually will be addressing both 
Item three and thirteen. Um, is that all right? N no. You, okay, you, should I just go to thirteen? Come back in thirteen. Yes. Okay, yes. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, and thank you for asking. Good evening, and I apologize, I might have to ask the same question. We are, I can talk about the tenant, the plan. Is that correct? I was in that meeting, by the way, on July 15th. So can I talk about it? So the yes. item, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, yes, yes, you may, um, but just so you understand, um, it, the only item before council on this item was just what will that subcommittee generally talk about? And the, it's just six broad subject matter areas. The actual specific policy issues is what they'll dig into more on um, item 13. But you are welcome to make a uh, public comment on this item as well. All right, well, let me make a public comment now then. My name is Adela Trainer. I'm a community member. I am a real estate agent, and I was in that meeting on July 15th. As I told some colleagues earlier today, I'm cranky today. I've had a long day, busy, and I'm a little less cranky. But um, part of my crankiness was because when I read what was coming forward, um, it was not what I understood at that meeting on July 15th. And some of it is just downright as the language. Uh, the city's path towards tenant protection initiatives. That doesn't sound like a conversation to me. And I thought we were moving forward to Let's have a conversation. I've been asking for a long time on this particular committee. Hey, I'm a community member. I'm in the field working with property owners and people who are looking for housing. I've got something to add. And Don, no one asks me. I have not been invited to the table. And that's all we've been asking for is we've got a oh, not just the Association of Realtors, Realtors, people in the field, the California Association of Realtors, National, we've got a lot of stuff behind us. We've got something to contribute. We want to help with this issue. So when I see this and it feels like, oh, we're just going to move forward and no one's asking me, yeah, I get a little cranky. So the, really, that's what I want to say about that. I was in that room. I did not understand that this was going to go forward. What I understood was we were going to allow the maybe the HRC to begin their work with counseling and with giving information and workshops for the community, uh, but not, um, you know, not moving forward with, with something that we ne never even had a chance to talk about and work out. I believe in this community, we have the capacity to come together, kind of like what you said, Doug. We have the, the sense to figure things out. This is a complicated issue. But in all my years in this community and working with issues and events, I have never felt cranky, a little blindsided, like I felt when I read this. So I've said my piece. Uh, I'll be around. I am still willing. I want to help. I don't give up easy. And those of you who know me, you know that. So thank you for your time. And also, thank you for your service, all of you, staff included. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Matt Caprito and Cami Pinsack. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. You know, I've attended the, the HOPE subcommittee for a number of years. And at the conclusion of the last meeting, Council Members were very clear and agreed to engage in outreach with stakeholders. That's it. So why we have, we're doing anything else, I, I'm really not clear about that. This has been promised for multiple years. Instead, staff on their own has brought this agenda item to you for consideration. And I'm, I'm, I'm troubled. This should be troubling for all of us. This was not agreed to. Do you know what the real world is? If anyone's staff went outside the direction of council, of leadership, their heads would roll. I'm not really sure how we got to listen to the tape. I, I ask you and implore each of you to listen to the recording and you will see it's very clear. The only thing that was asked was to engage and outreach. 
So what you have before you was never agreed by the subcommittee. It, more importantly, has no community involvement, no input, no ideas. We don't even know the specific issues faced by the residents. There's no outreach to stakeholders and no solution. I, I tell you, I, I think we can do better. This is so disappointing to me. And this is not an indictment of staff. They're not bad people. I'd love to hang out with staff. They probably wouldn't want to hang out with me. But the bottom line is we need to do better. This is not what was, this, was, this, this should not be on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cam Finza, followed by Jorge De Leon. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Cam Pinsack. I am the 2024 President of the Ventura County Coastal Association of Realtors, representing over 2,000 housing professionals in West Ventura County. I support clear direction of the subcommittee, as well as collaboration and clear communication with all stakeholders our association is made up of housing experts and have abundant resources in terms of research capabilities and policy expertise. And we are eager to be part of the solution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jorge Daniel, followed by Stephen Colbo. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Jorge Daniel. I live at 205 Virginia Drive here in Ventura, New Hampshire's District. Um, I was one of the speakers there that, uh, that afternoon, July, but I also remember that back in March 26th, if I'm not mistaken, you actually had a direction, a very clear direction as to be able to um, engage and, and, and look for ways for us to you know, get the community engagement. As a speaker on July, I clearly remember that there was you know, one item, one, to not look for an RFP, but there was a direction, a recommendation for community engagement. Okay, community engagement, which has not yet happened. Yet, in the consent agenda item, there are specific items that are not necessarily what we heard. And as the, Mr. Derkhalter actually mentioned, there's a little bit of confusion as to what happened, right? And what we read on the proposal. And here I am just in, in uh, objecting to how it's been presented and actually am uh, calling for the item to be voted down. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Caldwell, followed by Denise Lepar. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Caldwell. I serve as the president and CEO of the Ventura Chamber of Commerce. We have about 700 members that represent about 25,000 employees here in Ventura. I, too, am concerned about the process. I attended the meeting on July 15th. I also spoke at the Hopes and Solutions Committee meeting that evening or afternoon. Um, and my recollection is the subcommittee did not recommend approval of the tenant protections work plan. The subcommittee only provided direction to extend public outreach. So the council member Johnson, I agree with you and truly wish that this had been kind of cleared up before this evening, because I think when this item came out, uh, it was very confusing to the public. Uh, it feels a bit like the cart before the horse, particularly when item 13 tonight is dealing with more specifics of the tenant protections. Um, for those of us who have been in sales, we're all familiar with the term of presumptive close. This feels very much like a presumptive close. I believe that such a controversial and disruptive decision deserves, at the very least, a robust, fact-based discussion with broad input from all stakeholders, not just one side or the other. Thank you. Our next speaker is Luis Lombard, followed by Janet Spursler. Good evening, Louise Lampera of Ventura County Co-Lab. Um, I want to build on what Ms. Caldwell said. Uh, and speaking to specifically an item on the work plan, the section for tenant protection policies. Um, it is clear that there is a cloud of confusion surrounding this particular paragraph. What is in the staff report does not seem to align with the transcript 
of the subcommittee meeting nor the recollections of a few of the committee members. So I urge the council to clarify on the record before you vote what exactly is being approved in the HOPE subcommittee work plan. Let's avoid accidentally approving the acceptance of a plan and policies that, based on deliberations tonight, clearly haven't even been established yet. Clear up the record, clear up the staff report, be sure that the motion made tonight is very clear that this is being worked on. It is not being adopted. It has not been approved. It's a work in progress. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janice Whistler. My name is Janice Whistler, and I am the broker owner of Rent 805, servicing about 45 properties in the city of Ventura. I'm also a part of the National Association of Residential Property Managers. I think the key word is confusing tonight. It seems as though we're not really sure what happened between that meeting, which I was at as well. Um, I was also at that meeting that Jorge De Leon spoke about earlier, where we have constantly said the housing providers would like to have a seat at the table. Though there have been many a meeting, and each time we show up, because we really want to be a part of the discussion, we are not asked to have a seat at the table. And it seems like it's going to be a little biased at this point. Um, and it's concerning because I support clear direction of the subcommittee with all stakeholders being a part of it. You know, these stakeholders who are housing providers, we have the knowledge and the resources to give you information that's pretty clear cut and concise. In fact, you'll see more about it later when we talk about, you know, agenda number 13. So with that said, you know, we would like to have a seat at the table. We would like to have our voices heard. We would like to be a part of the solution. I don't know, a realtor out there that can't find a solution to the problem because this, this is how we live on the daily. So we'd like to have a seat at the table. Thank you for your time and your consideration. And hopefully uh, we can have less confusion because I feel like we're a little cart before the horse at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes public speakers Friday three. Back to City Council. Uh, Mr. Hogan. Um, thank you, Mayor. I may have a, a suggested um, alternate motion that may, or a suggested motion for Council to make that may clarify the situation a little bit, if you will. Um, so instead of, um, as listed to approve the hope and solution subcommittee work plan uh, maybe an alternate motion could be approve the updated scope of the subcommittee based on the six items listed in the staff report and direct staff to return with an ordinance codifying the scope and updating the committee name to the housing and homelessness uh, subcommittee Okay, so basically um, approve the updated scope and that scope is best um, identified on as the six items. Yes, yeah, so taking out the work plan word, which okay. I think has caused confusion. So instead we would just say approve the updated scope of the subcommittee based on the six items listed in the staff report and direct staff to return with an ordinance codifying the scope and updating the subcommittee name to Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee. And, and the assumption there is that staff can't do that without going out to the public and getting feedback, correct? Well, the real, the real feedback on, I think the substantive work plan issue is what will be discussed in item 13. Got it. Okay, Council Member Campos. I just wanted to clarify for the public, the last HOPES committee meeting was on August 19th. So I think that there may have been confusion about when decisions were made to bring this to council. 
So July 15th, there was a long, long discussion, but it was not decided. August 19th, a motion was made and it was approved to bring this to council at this time. It is not tenant protections being passed in item 13. It is a work plan to bring us to it, which will engage the community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you. I, I will note that Councilmember Halter seems really eager to say something. So could he go before me? Please. He has a reply to Mr. Hogan. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Johnson. Um, it's just, um, I, I like what uh, Mr. Hogan uh, suggests with one caveat. On number six, tenant protection policies, starting with outreach to all stakeholders. And then that's, that's the motion I could, I could support. Can you repeat that last part, Mr. Halter? Starting with outreach to all stakeholders. On number six. And Mayor, with that, I would actually like to bring staff back up to ask a question about that before I begin my time. Okay. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, there seems to be, and, and I'll talk about this in my comments, a little confusion about where this came from. But our housing element, which we did a couple of years ago now, it specifically obligates us to work on tenant protections, doesn't it? Absolutely, that's correct. Okay. Um, does it give deadlines for some of these things? Absolutely, it does give deadlines that we check in with HCG on an annual basis through our annual progress report. I do want to note that during the very lengthy process to certify the housing element, there were no changes made during the probably 18 months that we went back and forth with HCG. So none of the dates were adjusted to reflect the time that we took to get certification. HCD is well aware of that. So most of those dates are probably behind about 18 months because of that certification. Thank you, but so I mean, City Council was supposed to have already not had a, had recommendations made to us by originally it was July twenty twenty four, correct? That's correct. Right. So 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 this so this idea of tenant protections didn't just pop up in a in a sub. Is that correct? Absolutely. Not only is it listed in the housing element, but a number of other city documents. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Dow. Thank you. Um. You know, I don't have any more questions. So, so Mayor, I think I understand what's going on here. And, and this is what some of us would call pocket safe. It's clear from some of the emails we received on item number 13 that some people received, I'm guessing, emails or newsletters that really um, took liberties with what council was attempting to do tonight. And understandably, people were very upset. I don't know how else to characterize emails that are saying, we know you're going to do red caps. That's just not a thing. But the language in some of the emails is so is identical. Somebody wrote this, this language and sent it to people and said, you know, everything is a mess. I, from what I hear about on Facebook, similar things happen there. Um, there is no tenant initiative mentioned in the staff report from the from the Hope Committee. It's the, it's the work plan, which council directed staff to go back and work with the Hope's subcommittee on. The, the thing that gets me mad is this is something that we have been talking about for years now. We talked, started talking about tenant protections way back when, because it it was, it was almost a year before we had our housing element actually approved by the state. So this is something that we've been talking about almost my entire time on council. We have a public process that includes subcommittee meetings. That is what it means to have a seat at the table. We obviously have special interest groups that want to have one-on-one -on -one face meetings, face-to-face -face meetings with the city attorney, the city manager, department managers. That's Okay, in some situations, but it's also how nothing can happen in a city. There are so many people tonight that talk about having been to so many of our subcommittee meetings where these things have been discussed. This has not been a secret. This is not coming out of nowhere. 
If what you know came from an email or a newsletter, then maybe it's a surprise, and I'm sorry if that's the case, but, you know, we, and we'll talk about this in, in number 13, um, none of this is coming from a vacuum. The idea of community engagement, sure, the staff report that went to the HOPES set up committee in July talked about the need for community engagement on this part. And in the staff report coming to us, they talked about it as well. That was never cut out. That's always been part of the plan. There will be, I'm sure, workshops, but we all, I think, need to understand that no special interest groups, whether it's tenants or renters or auto center dealers, get to go behind the scenes and try to kill things that council wants to do or to push something to the council that council is reluctant to do. And so if you are one of the recipients of those emails, I hope that tonight you listen and take us out of word when we say that this is what's happening with the work plan, this is what's happening with, with item number 13. Because if we're going to have a conversation and we want to have a seat at the table, it helps if you're not coming with misconceptions and it helps if you're not assuming that anybody, whether it's landlords or tenants or council or staff, that any of them are acting on that thing. So I really hope we can make some progress with this mayor. Um, I don't know that we need the, the language for number six, so I won't be seconding that as it, I believe it was a substitute motion. But um, I look forward to, and I thank Mr. Hogan for limiting the scope to make it more clear uh, exactly what it is that we're putting in the purview of the host. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Mr. Gray. Mr. McReynolds. I, I just, I want to bring us back to just the hopes and solutions. I mean, uh, with all due respect, Councilmember Walter, I agree with Councilmember Johnson. All we want is that if we ever talk about tenant protections, it's the Hopes and Solution Committee that's going to talk about it with no, no caveats. They will make, you know, you as the chair would make a recommendation to the, with, a, with along with the two other members to the full council. It, all of this does is give you the auspices by which to talk about it. Uh, and that could be any number of things that you guys make a recommendation. I think the idea is to keep this general just so that th if this topic comes up, this is where it stops first. Uh, on it, uh, on it. So I, I agree with Councilmember Johnson. I, I, I don't want to add with community outreach. I think that's an item for thirteen, and we can we should discuss that. But for just the committee, I think it's the six items per uh, the from the direction of the city attorney uh, with that uh, on it. And the only other thing that I would like to add is I appreciate Councilmember Johnson's invaluable experience, kind of walking us through some of that history. Is if we can bring it back. In, in a, a shorter time, like how long would it take to bring that ordinance back before the full council? Uh, thank you for the question, Councilmember Rick Reynolds. Um, I, we should be able to, um, I don't think it would quite be ready for the September 10th meeting, but it should be ready for the next meeting after that um, to okay. be on consent. That, that's the only thing I would ask is that we keep it broad, and we get it back so that we can get Councilmember Johnson's insight while we still have his opportunity on that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Durant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilmember Compos, you had made a comment about the last meeting we had. And I just for clarification, what what was your what were you saying about our last meeting? I was just clarifying the date of the last meeting. Okay. And did you say if we brought anything forward? Because we talked about deferral, the deferral program and the annual fees, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. I was just getting clarification. Well, we did we did instruct the Hopes Committee to bring this to council to discuss the public engagement aspect, which is what item 13 really not, is. Not at our last meeting. Our last meeting, we did the other two items. This, this was on the July 15th meeting. Whatever you say. Well, thank you. Um, so what I'm hearing is that we, um, we're, we're going to bring this back. 
that what I'm hearing? So, um, let's see if I can bring this back. So, um, the city attorney made a recommendation that we consider a recommendation other than the one that we have in front of us, and that was about the scope, updated scope. And I, we're a city council on that. Do we agree with, with that change? And there was a motion, and it was somebody has to make that motion. Did you make the motion? Mr. Hall, yes, yes. I'll, I said I was supporting the motion if it included these words on item number six. Right? Okay, and was that seconded? Okay, do we have a second on the motion, Mr. Halter's motion? I would have willing to second it if we just did the uh, rent stabilization, would be under their office, this office. Okay, is that acceptable to you, Mr. Halter? I have a comment on that because there are some things that were said that I think need some clarity, and then we could go from there. And that's um, the fact that um, the number of times that I've seen over the years, even at, even including the last four years, that we have waited and waited to have conversations about something and go to the next subcommittee meeting or the next outreach meeting and see that a decision was already made, I probably can't count those times on one year. And so because of the uh, sensitivity and the, uh, the need for all parties to be involved in creating the best path forward, because we all want the same thing, okay, is I think it's important that we all have the trust that there will be a public outreach to, to all stakeholders. That's why I feel that's, that's a small task to do, add those few words to this line item, and then let's move forward to item 13. But I think the number of times, whether it's seeing different heights of buildings appearing in different places on a work plan or see, uh, a letter go out that was, we all wondered where that letter come from. Um, there's been missteps. Again, we're only as good as an organization. We're only good as our, as our weakest link. Somebody who thinks that they take privilege. So I get that. But we're all trying really hard. And I'm talking about creating trust that we will go out and seek input from all, all stakeholders. And I think that's that's an important few words to put into that document. Mr. City Clerk, can you read the motion? Sure. Can I please have a clarification from Councilmember McReynolds? Did you add something? Yeah. Oh. So we have uh, Mr. Hogan's motion, uh, or amended motion, to approve the updated scope based on the six items listed in the staff report, and for staff to return with the ordinance codifying that scope, and then for the, the name to change to the Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee, and then Councilmember Halter's addition to uh, the item six to begin with, starting with outreach to all stakeholders. And yes, I will not be second. Okay. No. I'm sorry, so it's a point of order. So what we have is you have your motion. You were suggesting a friendly amendment. No, you made the motion. You made a substitute motion. No, he made the motion, Councilmember Johnson. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. so now I would go. You would try this. Okay. So, do we have a second to Councilmember Halter's motion? Do we have a second to Mr. Halter's motion? It dies for a lack of a second. Do I have another motion? I'd like to move uh, the recommendation of the city attorney uh, with the language regarding tenant. So the six items, Councilmember Johnson's not in here. The affordable, uh, the, so the topics of the subcommittee's work, uh, I don't know if we use the word, scope, will be affordable housing policies, annual reporting, community development block grant, home investment fund, tenant homeless programs and policies, sorry, homeless programs and policies and tenant protection policies. will be under the auspices of the, the renamed Hope Screen. Okay. Do I have a second? And then second. Do I have a second? So okay. I, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm a second, but I, I want to make sure we're clear. We are not. We're not approving anything tonight, other than this is what the committee is working on. That's yes, that's 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 that is That is correct. And um, Councilmember Campos already uh, seconded the motion. Uh, she reached yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Further questions? Vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. We have a motion to double. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Halter. 
Uh, I want to mention that I will support the motion, but only knowing that we have item 13 coming up where I'll make sure that we do everything we can to put the words that I just described into that. Because I'm, all I'm trying to do is build trust in our community. And to me, it was a simple task. But I, get, I understand where my colleagues are coming from, and I'd like to move this forward. So I'm supporting it in the, in the vein of being a team, team player here and making sure we move forward. With and I think we team. understand where you're coming from as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you may now enter your vote. Waiting on a few more votes. All votes have been entered. Seven eyes, the motion carries. Thank you for that. It's on to the formal items number 12, purchasing of four fire engines, Chief. And Barbara McCormack and Mr. Morley. How's everybody doing tonight? Who's going to lead this presentation? Do that again. <laughs> good morning, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mayor Schrader and members of the council. My name is Barbara McCormick. I'm the city's fleet and facilities manager. Here with me tonight are Public Works Director Charlie Ebeling, Fire Chief David Indaya, and Chief Financial Officer Greg Morley. We're here to provide information regarding the purchase and replacement of four of the fire department's fire engines. The Fleet Services Division is responsible for the maintenance and replacement of all of the city's 458 vehicles and equipment. This includes the fire department's 15 apparatus vehicles. These 15 vehicles consist of aerial ladder trucks, fire engines, and a hazardous materials vehicle. The four vehicles that are identified for replacement are planned per the 25-year fire apparatus replacement plan. Fire engines have an approximate 20-year life for the National Fire Protection Association, which maintains standards and codes for fire protection. Replacement costs for these vehicles are collected through an internal service fund and, are, and accumulate in a dedicated fire apparatus cash account. Funding is held in the fire apparatus cash account until it's time to replace vehicles. These four engines have a four year build period. Three of the engines were put in service in 2007 and the fourth in 2008. Starting the build process now will allow for the new engines to be put in service as the current engines are scheduled for retirement. Should we begin the process now, the three that have been in service in, since 2007 will, re, will be replaced one year past their service life. And the fourth that, that has, has been, been in service, service since 2008 will be replaced at the 20 year mark. We are recommending that the order for the replacement for the four engines be placed this fiscal year based on the four year build period, current condition assessment of the vehicles, age of the fire apparatus when the new engines would be placed into service, standardization of current fire department operations and procurement efficiencies. The cost to purchase the four engines is $5.2 million, which is 5.5% below the manufacturer's suggested retail price. With contingency, fire suppression, and fire suppression tools and equipment, the 100% prepayment discount of $605,000 and the $40,000 discount to purchase four engines at once, the total potential cost is $5.4 million. The fire department and fleet services has researched electric and hybrid electric fire apparatuses to determine if they would be a viable option to replace the current fire engines. The current cost estimate per engine for an electric fire engine is $2.5 million, which is $1.2 million above the cost of the internal combustion engine before the discount. Electrical infrastructure upgrades will be needed um, at each station to support the charging needs of these vehicles. The estimated cost per station for electrical, the electrical upgrades is about $1 million, which is above the cost of the purchase price of the engines. Staff will continue to research electric vehicle technology for future purchases. 
The detailed recommendations are contained in the staff report, but in summary, staff recommendations are to approve and authorize the agreement with South Coast Fire Equipment not to exceed $4.7 million to the $200,000 contingency, authorize prepayment, discount, and execution of a lease purchase agreement with PNC Financial, and approve the necessary budget appropriations and transfers. With that, we're available to answer any questions. Council questions. I, I would compliment staff on uh, the 100 pages that we got on. It really helped us understand that fire engine is not a simple task, and there's a lot of things to consider. So thank you for that. Questions from Councilmember Johnson? Sorry, my uh, queuing system apparently isn't working. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, you know, as we've looked at um, adding new station and as we've looked at adding the paramedic squad, is that going to reduce the number of miles per year that each of the uh, each of our apparatuses will be getting? Yes, I mean, I would say with every apparatus we add, including like the paramedic squads and an additional station, the math again would equal out that the engines are going to be running through the calls if we have a station that adds a cemetery. Thank you. So hopefully when we get to a 15 year mark, um, it'll they'll be looking better than, than they have been in 15 years. Correct. Wonderful. I, I want to thank my colleagues, I want to thank staff um, for, for all the work on, on, on putting all of these pieces together. Mayor, this was one of the first things we dealt with um, and I was dispirited at times. Um, but, but I think we've really it's taken a lot of people, it's taken a lot of negotiations, um, but I'm so proud of the changes that have happened with our fire department. And that is one of the things I'll be most proud of when I leave. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions? Uh, Mr. McReynolds, followed by Mr. Halter, followed by Mr. Durant. Uh, so I have a question on the uh, the payment. So these each fire truck is $1.2 million. So, and then we're getting $150,000 discount because we're we'll paying the purchase. But if we were to hold on to the $1.2 million and just forego that, wouldn't we generate more interest in our own accounts than the discount? Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. And so we have two options before us. One is to make 100% prepayment. The other one is to enter into our lease purchase agreement where we don't have to make the prepayment giving us the opportunity to continually reinvest that cash that we don't uh, present as an outlet and make interest on that money uh, over the four years while these engines are being built and and uh, actually put ourselves in a better cash position and probably a, a lower cash outlay at the end. So it seems that would seem to make sense. And then just the question on You've got a $1.2 million purchase, and they give you, because you're ordering four at the same time, they give us a $10,000 discount. Seems a little ridiculous. I mean, on a $5 million purchase. That's correct. We're offering $10,000 per um, vehicle that we're purchasing. Thank you. If I can add to that a little bit. Originally, we had this discussion, and, and Ms. McCormick did come and tell us that they were offering us $10,000, and we had a discussion that day and asked her if she could ask for something better. And she negotiated with us and got us six hundred thousand dollars. So yeah, it was ten thousand dollars to begin with, but it ended up being six hundred forty-five thousand dollars. Their 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 original offer was ten thousand dollars per vehicle. Am I not reading it right? Isn't that what the staff report? Yeah. But yeah, you're right. They were offering ten thousand. We ended up with the six hundred forty-five thousand after Mr. McCormick negotiated. I apologize. I'm not seeing that. In the staff, can I, if I look at the fiscal impact, yeah, it, because it, in the document, the staff report, they list them as two different things. One of them, they list one as a prepayment discount, and the other one as just a, a discount for the multi vehicle, multi purchase. Is that what you're talking about? I'm just looking at the staff report at the, the, the requested action fiscal impact. I, don't, I see a $40,000 reduction. I don't see a $640,000 reduction. 
Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Well, the six hundred and four, the six hundred and five thousand dollar deduction is incorporated into that original recommendation for four million five hundred thousand dollars. So originally it was five point two million dollars. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Halter, then Mr. Duran, Mr. Mayor, and staff. Uh, I, have, I don't doubt at all the need. I know this is a definite need for this. Um, a lot of deferred uh, purchases and maintenance across the city. Um, I want to mention though that um, is there any salvage value in the vehicles that were being issued? It is our practice to auction them, and in the past, we've received roughly ten thousand per vehicle. Just oh, okay. Depends on the market is All right. Uh, great. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, it's good to be with you again. Um, thank you, staff, for your report. I have a, a question for you in regards to uh, the squad program. Um, I understand there's been reduced calls like um, station two and three, like there's been reduced calls for fire engines. Is that correct? I wouldn't say there's been reduced calls for fire engines there. There's been reduced call volume because they're sharing the same call load out of the, out of the fire station. But we're not, um, because they're not, you're not sending an engine on every call with the squad, correct? correct. And I, I understand that that's been a, a huge success in station two and three. Is that correct? correct? Yep. Okay. So just a curiosity, um, if that is such a success, how come we're not looking at squads um, instead of fire engines? Um, I think when I explained this previously, we we definitely are looking at squads right now. The goal was to add by NFPA recommendation based on our on our fires, on our geography, and on the fact that we were still covering the city the same way after 36 years with no addition of any fire suppression or rescue equipment, we add that seventh apparatus, which we're doing at Fire Station 7, and then we moved on to squads. So that's how we got to squad two and squad three. And right now we're not in a position to add anything additional just based on financing or, or, or staffing. Okay. So we, we did, we, that's exactly the order we went in is we, we made one, ad, one addition of one engine after almost four decades of not having an additional engine, but having our call volume increase and which included fires and also rescues and the difference in fires after 40 years of how fires burn. And as soon as we got that engine added to our staffing um, on a future roster and on the current roster, we added squad two and squad three immediately after that. So, so the plan is to get more squads. So we don't have to run our engines on every call? Well, the plan will be to get more squads when we have somewhere to put them. Right now we have uh, at two and three, we, are, we have five people in the two stations that were never designed for five people. So, so right, right now we are, we, are, we are bursting at the seams and that's gonna be a whole other discussion. That's gonna be a 50 to 60 year outlook of how we address our infrastructure and the stations that are very small and built in the 1950s. We, we well, I'd love to add it, but our stations were never designed for more than three people. Half our stations were designed for three. So if we add a squad, we have to add the rooms, the accommodations, the apparatus bay, the ramps, and all of the So that's all going to be a much bigger fight. Right now we're doing, they're surviving, but they're, they're, they're splitting rooms and parking is an issue and so forth. But we're making it work because of the impact of the service of the community. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Councilmember Johnson. Sorry, uh, thank you, Mayor Schroeder. Uh, I just wanted to also add that, um, uh, just to clarify, that there are a limited number of suppliers of uh, these types of apparatus. So I think uh, Ms. McCormick did an excellent job sort of reaching out to the right suppliers and, and uh, uh, negotiating the right price. Also, just wanted to point out that um, in terms of the cost, we are looking at cost at this point also, and I wouldn't want to wait any longer. wouldn't recommend that we wait longer uh, for this purchase because, as we all know, uh, costs are skyrocketing. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. That actually answers one of my points, you know, at Gold Coast. As we look at buying buses, our, our projections for the cost, especially now that there are only two builders of, of buses, is that the, the cost of the new bus is going to greatly outpace in a rate of inflation or CPI. Um, Chief, you know, when we talk about NFDA guidelines for apparatus and age, every station needs an engine, correct? For coverage, it's called a 1710 is our assembly, is that FDA assembly? 
And so to have the right number of engines within the right number of response time, <clears throat> excuse me, given that they're all in the station at the same time, yes. And and some of those some of those engines are definitely showing their age, right? If we have some where there has to be trays of kitty litter underneath them to catch oil, for example. And, and we, I'm sure we all would have heard from some of our firefighters um, just their concerns about that, right? So these, and these have been driven hard, harder than maybe the expectations were because we have so many calls for service that for us it's, it's an issue of miles from the odometer, let's say, rather than years, correct? Correct. Miles and engine hours. And I would say, yeah, as Mr. Chronic talked about, we're, we're right on track with ordering now to get those engines replaced right around the 20 year mark, which is our goal um, at this point. And I know previously, I'd say about five years ago, we discussed looking at a 15 year replacement cycle for these engines, just based on call volume and the lifespans are, this is fire service wide, not just in the city of Ventura, but that's an incredibly expensive proposition to try and replace these types of vehicles every 15 years versus every 20 to 23. And so right now we're just, we're very grateful that we're close to getting them at 20 at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Campos. Thank you, Chief. And I, um, I requested about, um, often you come to us and you have statistics about how much, how many calls there are, what types of calls there are, how often the trucks go out, how often the squads go out. One thing that you can't predict or maintain clear statistics on is wildfires. Um, are we in a position to operate against the wildfire like we did with the Thomas fire without new trucks? I think the Thomas fire is really not a good benchmark because the answer is absolutely not. There's no single fire department anywhere in the state of California that's prepared to respond. That's why we had 2,400 fire departments and 8,000 firefighters here at the height of the Thomas fire. So I would say what I would call for the threat to our community and my responsibility to care for our residents is we are, we are well prepared for our initial response. But I mean, and this, this is true throughout the county, is when there's a bona fide brush fire start, there, Ventura County Fire, Oxnard Fire, Fed Fire, and Ventura City, there, there's an engine from at least all four agencies going because of what those can do in a, as quickly as they can spread. So, but having having the Station 7 moving forward and having the squads be there to pick up calls where the engine can go and do fire suppression, you know, um, and I think that's the thing that, that I think I've shared before is you don't see our success stories every day because we put those out because we get there quickly and we suppress the fire and it doesn't make the paper. It's the ones that grow beyond our first two or three engines that we can't catch that I send out a critical incident notification on. So we're going out every day and there's car fires that are catching houses on fire and brush on fire that we're catching. And those don't make the paper, or, you know, you don't hear much about it because we, we do our job and we do it well. Um, but so to answer your question, I mean, the Thomas fire is probably not the best benchmark because the answer is no. But when we have, you know, I will call it a standard start where we know there's red flag warnings, the wind is there, the weather's coming. I mean, we're on the we're on the brink of that right now. We're ready to respond. We have a very robust initial attack using those engines um, and having very good neighbors that come very quickly when we need their help, just like we do for them when they have the same emergency. Thank you for that. If we don't order these engines, how long will we have that level of preparation? I think the issue will be the reliability of the current engines. And I mean, even our, even more than, than I can is, is Ms. McCormick and her fleet staff will tell you that we are, we're holding several of these engines together at this point. Um, and I think it's important to remember, it, it's not unlike like Councilmember Johnson was speaking to with being able to procure vehicles right now. It's very difficult for, for a specialized vehicle. That's a two, two and a half decade vehicle. It's gonna take a while to get here. So even with the engines that are the way they are right now, we're making them through us using them and through our fleet staff maintaining them and keeping them on the road to serve the community. It's gonna be another four years when they arrive by the time they get here. Thank you for that. And you know that I will definitely support this, but I wanted to clarify our need. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Mary. Just a quick question. Um, so this is for four vehicles, correct? Um, in, I guess, looking at the totality of our supply, do you anticipate any other vehicles having to be replaced um, like, like these? these? We do maintain a 25 year projection for all of the fire apparatus vehicles. The next one in line will be five years from now, based on the age of all. When we, it will be when? Sorry. Five years from now. Oh, five years from now. Okay. And if you want to, I mean, if this is going to take four years, like, do, like are, is it going to come up quickly then to get approval to replace those? I'm just trying to. It's just one other vehicle that's due for replacement, and that's when we would start to ask for it. Isn't that? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Other questions, if not, as well. So, public comments, please. Thank you, Mayor. We do have one public comment on this item. Uh, Philip Fields. Uh, it's Philip Fields. We would prefer if you use the microphones, please, sir. We can't hear you. The microphones would be right there. I respect the fire department, and I try to assist them. And I'm not here to be in the way. However, the previous emergency we had in, the, in our city, as climate change is producing more uh, wildfires, it is sad to find that our, our fire department is not ready for evacuation, et cetera, et cetera. And it's sad to see different dialogue. You have no leadership. You're a failed person. A leader goes with his five men. A leader loves all the time. A leader stands by its union, by his union. A leader is with his man. However, in virtue of climate change, continuing blindly the policy of perpetuation of fossil fuel to have us bleed fossil fuel. Eat fossil fuel, drink fossil fuel for us, for the firemen, for the children and grandchildren. It's not a sound policy. We gotta go beyond our impacts. China being a poor country, by 1930, they're gonna be 40% electric energy. Their vehicles, that's it, 40%. However, from our federal officials to our local officials, they want to cross and have us forever breathe fossil fuel, see our friends dying of cancer, and see our firemen suffering cancer. It is not a sound policy. You might want to consider along the way and maybe the local politician, consider electrical power because it's necessary, it's a must, and the longer we ignore it and think it's gonna go away or we're gonna fix it at the last minute, it won't happen. We have no mobility, no truck, nothing to evacuate, and the previous emergencies of wildfires have crossed that there. there was nobody to evacuate with chairs, etc. And that is something that you guys have to think. You got to go out of your box, and the community expects more of you, not only your words, but your actions. And uh, though tonight we cannot solve it, anyway, I ask you to approve it unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Stelz. I think we should chat. Are there any public speakers anymore? Thank you, Mayor. I think we spoke to speakers for this item. Back to City Council, a motion is required. 
I move that we approve um, staff's recommendations. I second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Duran, was that a second? Second? Or question? Comment. Comment? I mean, please. So, um, I, I just want to let you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to endorse this. I'm going to support it. Um, but, you know, we talked before about squads and things like that. And, you know, you've had great success with those. And I'm just, I just want to make sure that we're still on track to focus on taking care of our firefighters, making sure that we do have squads. Because I know that when we had squads, when we have squads in those units, we have less um, calls for the fire engines to go out, which is, which is awesome, which gives people more sleep, which means that they're not going out on PTSD or whatever kind of lever, you know, and we get them back sooner. Whatever the case is, I do it for the health of our firefighters. I just want to make sure we're still on track looking at the bigger picture and looking at how we can support our firefighters. If I may, absolutely. This is a replacement of old engines. So, I mean, this, to me, those are two completely separate issues is we have, if anything, I'm providing the firefighters with a safer engine that's reliable, that's going to get to the location safely and not be like, you know, wired together and break down and not be able to put the fire out and so forth. So this is going to take them from the station, deliver exemplary service to the community and return them to the station safely to get back to their rest period if they get some rest. So what we're doing tonight is just approving, replacing old engines with new engines. I'm not adding engines and not considering adding more squads tonight in any I, way. I totally understand that. And I spoke to some firefighters and they were telling me how how bad the engines are. And of course I'm gonna support that because mm -hmm. I don't want them to have bad engines. And that's, and, and I say it does have something to do with it because um, we still need to look for the plan the future, right? Because if, if we're using more squads, less engines, then we're not gonna have to buy as many engines down the road because we'll be maintaining a little bit better. Cause we're not gonna be running them to death all the time because we got squad. Does that make sense? It does, but I would say it will be very close unless we start to diminish service to the community. Because right now we're replacing these engines right on track. We, oh, and I'm not saying I'm not saying not to get the engines. I'm right. just saying as we look forward, as we look forward, mm -hmm. you know, let's look at the, the stations that have the squads and see how well they're doing and start to replicate that so we can keep the health of our firefighters. That's that's yeah. all I'm saying. And that's the plan. Do it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions, comments? If not, I'll go to a vote. Vote, please. Okay, I make a motion and second to approve staff's recommendation. You can now your vote. Seven eyes, motion carries. Okay, on to item 13. And before we do that, we'll take a 20 minutes biological break. We'll be back at 726. Thank you.
Okay, let's get started, please. Okay, on to item number 13, Tenant Protection Work Plan and Professional Service Agreement with the Housing Rights Center. Miss. Um, Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before we get started, I'll turn it over to the city attorney. Um, thank you, Ms. Diamond. Uh, Mayor, council members and the public, I just wanted to make one announcement before we begin this item. I'm a member of the public, uh, submitted an item to me alleging um, uh, potential issues with uh, council member usage of Facebook and a potential Brown Act violation. I um, reviewed the issues on Facebook and with the three council members uh, identified, and I did not find that they had done any type of, of wrongdoing regarding this item or any potential Brown Act violation and believe they can participate. So I just want to clear the air on that. And with, with that, I will turn it back to Ms. Diamond. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council members, uh, community members here and at home. My name is Rachel Diamond. I'm the Community Development Director. Tonight, I also have Leona Rollins, the Housing Services Manager, as well as Rachel West, a Management Analyst within the Housing Services Division. And tonight we're talking about tenant protections. And there's one word that I'm not saying, and I think you can see it on the screen, and it's the word work plan. And I think that um, we owe both the community, the council, um, and the housing and homelessness subcommittee a bit of clarification on what we're really doing here today. Because I think that that term got us really caught up in the, the uh, subcommittee um, item, as well as this one about what it really means and what we're doing here today. So the discussion today is really focused around the development of a tenant protections program. Um, the tenant protections program is something that's required in the housing element. It's one of the city council goals, and then there are other associated documents that mention doing this type of program. So this really comes from both the council and the city adopted um, documents. Initially, staff went out for an RFP for a robust tenant protection program um, to have an outside firm really conduct uh, the analysis with the community, conduct community engagement, craft the program, and come back. We received one response to that RFP, and it was for $500,000. Um, I think all of you were very well aware of our budget, and $500,000 is what we have about how much we have budgeted for all of our housing element implementation for this fiscal year. And really, it's meant to roll over and conduct the number of years of implementation. And so we do have limited resources. And so as a result, we took a lot of the, um, the prep work in house to get this program started. And the first thing um, that we uh, as staff wanted to do is really develop kind of the areas of focus related to this work plan. Um, the first is working with the Housing Rights Center um, to provide tenant landlord services and education to the community and mediation programs. And this is really the bulk of what the Tenant Protection Program really is, is providing legal services to the community so that they can deal with tenant landlord issues and to provide a format for people to be able to ask questions and to report issues with their landlords as well. So that's a contract that's before you this evening to work with the Housing Rights Center in a more expanded um, new contract that would allow for that type of program. Additionally, staff had recommended community engagement and ultimately a RFP to move forward in the future with a rent registry. What happened at the subcommittee was that uh, the subcommittee asked that um, we move forward with the Housing Rights Center contract, again, which is the bulk of this program, and that before moving forward with any additional items, that we do community engagement to talk to the community and all stakeholders, the wide range of people that are involved in this, um, in this issue, uh, which really affects everyone. Um, in the community. And ultimately, um, the subcommittee recommended that uh, we hold off on anything else before we uh, engage with the community. So I really want to highlight that and be very, very clear that at this point, what we're moving forward with you tonight is really the Housing Rights Center contract 
and then talking about per the recommendation of the Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee moving forward in the future with community engagement and not taking any other action beyond that without coming back to the subcommittee and to the city council for final adoption. So with that, I'll turn it over to Leona Rollins to give you a lot more detail. So thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and I will begin with the presentation. So what are tenant protections? So tenant protections are legal measures designed to safeguard the rights and well-being of renters. And these protections can vary by jurisdiction, but most likely include things like just cause eviction, the right to habitability, risk stabilization, and protection for har from harassment. Um, the path towards tenant protections have been um, is involved with three different policies. The first policy being the sixth um, cycle of our housing element. It's one of our implementation goals. The next one would be uh, the, this fiscal year city council goal, and as well when the planning commission made their recommendation and then city council adopted the Ventura County Homelessness Plan on March 26th of this year, they also gave us direction to work on tenant protection initiatives. So the Hopes and Solutions Subcommittee, now named the Housing and Homeless Subcommittee, on July 15th um, of this year, the tenant protections was presented to the subcommittee and the work plan included legal services, community outreach, and RFP, also known as a request for proposal to develop a registry. During this particular meeting, we provided additional background information that was shared in the staff report. This includes Costa Hawkins. And for those not familiar with Costa Hawkins, Costa Hawkins is a measure that was passed in 1995, which essentially means that multifamily units, as well as single family homes built after February 1st, 1995, cannot be subject to any sort of rent control or risk stabilization. We also have the California Assembly Bill 1482, also known commonly as AB 1482, which is a Tenant Protection Act that passed in 2020. Um, without an act of the state, this, this bill would actually expire in 2030. This was when we started seeing um, different initiatives in terms of housing providers or landlords only being able to terminate their tenants for a just cause reason or a no cause reason. And then finally, we have California Senate Bill 567, which is also called the Homeless Prevention Act. And under California Senate Bill 567, essentially, it provided more protections and also gave the city the opportunity to provide these particular services if they choose to do so. And additionally, we also talked about what's going on in our neighboring jurisdictions, which include the city of Oxford as well as the city of Ohio. So during the subcommittee meeting, there were six public speakers doing the particular item. We had four speakers who did not support um, additional tenant protections over current state law, and two speakers supported actually moving forward with some tenant protection program. Basically, the subcommittee did a vote unanimously to recommend that the city council approve the tenant protection program with the condition that city staff complete the community engagement component first and then return to the subcommittee and council with additional recommendations. So at this particular time, the subcommittee has recommended that we did not see, proceed with the actual registry. Um, we are going to engage with the public and then we'll make a determination through feedback from the subcommittee on how to move forward. And I'll turn it over to Rachel West. All right, so currently the city of Ventura does have a partnership with the city or with the Housing Rights Center, um, and they do provide services for us, including fair housing counseling, general landlord tenant counseling, annual fair housing events, distribution of multilingual brochures, um, as well as in person and virtual workshops. Um, we are um, expanding for a new contract with the Housing Rights Center, which will provide additional services that would include mediation services, housing clinics, educational outreach, and tenant referrals. Um, and these services would be provided to all of the um, city residents, regardless of income level, as well as also having multiple languages. Um, so for the community workshop um, portion, um, staff will conduct a series of four community workshops. And these workshops are really to engage the community, um, to talk about the current state laws, as mentioned before, um, SB 567, as well as like AB 1482, um, and gather community feedback um, from as many people as possible. So this would include tenants, landlords, um, the Realtors Association, Real estate agents, community advocates, nonprofits, cause, um, literally to just give everybody an opportunity to share um, what their thoughts are, what they recommend, how they believe the policies and procedures should look like, and just incorporate all of that into this broader program. 
Um, there will be two in-person workshops and two virtual workshops in October and November. Um, if we go ahead and move forward with this, we will um, work with our communications team to uh, solidify those dates as well as um, post all of this information on social media so people are aware. Um, we'll have it on our um, city page as well as also going out in the public with some flyers and posters just to get the word out to as many people as possible. Um, this input will be used to craft next steps for this program, um, and then we will return to the subcommittee and council with recommendations that we've gathered from these um, workshops. So future action items um, is to complete these uh, workshops by November 2024 and present all the feedback that we received to the subcommittee and then further um, solidify kind of what recommendations we do want to um, bring forth for the program. Um, and then working along with city staff to kind of then build, um, you know, recommendations to bring forth to the commission and city council by uh, June 2025. Um, so three out of four of our staff recommendations here are in relation to the um, HRC contract. Um, and then the other one is just kind of about, you know, this path towards tenant protections as well as like these community workshops. Um, we are open for questions or comments. Thank you. City Council. Questions? Mr. Halter, you might have to. My queuing system's not working okay. apparently. Great. So Thank you, you know. Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you, staff, again, for this report. Um, a couple of questions to start with is I see that when it comes to uh, tenant protections, there's actually uh, several different line items that would uh, uh, clarify what tenant protections are. And everything from rent control or stabilization, that's cause evictions, relocation assistance, and the buyout agreements, and so forth. Um, you highlighted one in particular, rental registry. Is there a reason why that one's highlighted in the other 10 items or not? I don't believe there was a specific reason that it was highlighted for in terms of the formatting, um, but that's certainly you know one of the items that we've looked at as part of the program. But based on the, the um, subcommittee's recommendations thus far, we're not directly moving forward with that item. We'll seek to receive input from the community during community engagement related to that and many other topics. And then see from there. So we are going to go out, uh, as we discussed earlier tonight, going out for a uh, speak to all stakeholders and gather input and see what where there's a will and where there's an interest to move forward. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And then when it comes to the uh, registry, a more specific question, uh, just for as an example, is, um, uh, you know, things change over time constantly and the changes in the, in the inevitable uh, things like uh, being in business. I know that um, there was a point in time that to build a pool as a contractor, it's one permit and then it went to five. And now it's back down to three permits to build a pool to run my business. Uh, at one time it was one permit and then it went to five and it's down to four permits now to simply run one business. Okay. Four licenses. I mean, same thing with uh, owning property when you own property that you rent out, um, for 15 of the years that I've been fortunate enough to have a rental property, I um, had to have a separate business license. And what 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 determined the fee of that business license was, was based upon income. income. So, so what, what difference, difference would a rental registry have versus somebody paying a fee to use that property as a rental that has reported the income generated from that property? So generally how a rental registry would work is that landlords would pay a fee per unit. And so it would allow a landlord that has one unit to pay that singular fee and a landlord that has you know, a large number of units to pay multiples of that. And that would be on an, typically they're on an annual basis. And what that does is it requires landlords to actually register, not just to receive a license to operate within the city, but it specifically would require um, a, some specific information about the unit that's being rented. So what is the unit, who's renting it, and how much are they paying, and are there any additional fees, as an example of things that would require. So we're able to collect additional data that effectively would allow us to do a vast majority of enforcement based on state law. Like for example, state law does cap uh, the allowable rent if someone tells us their rent last year or their rent this year, then we're able to automatically calculate what that percentage is and it flags 
that unit to help us understand if there's an issue. Additionally, the registration of each unit that's rented in the city would effectively operate as a business license. Today, it's interesting to hear the evolution of permits. And yeah. again, we're always trying to reduce the number of pieces of paper that you need, certainly. Um, but ultimately, right now, you don't need a regular business license in the city of Ventura to rent out an apartment. So we're also missing out on that registration of people operating businesses within the city because of the nature of that business. And so ultimately, what cities typically do, um, what our neighbors are doing that have these types of programs, is they utilize the funding from the rent registry in order to fund all of the tenant protection, the rest of the tenant protection programs, and things like a contract with HRC or other legal services. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to look for more than anything to make sure there's no redundancy and we're not overburdening people with bureaucracy. You know? At this point, again, based on a, a hypothetical registry, we're not proposing any right now. Um, it would only require them to go to one place, which is multiple places. So I appreciate that um, comment too, that we want to keep this simple. Whatever this is, we want to keep this simple for people to utilize. Recognizing that the more cost we add to rent to people who are providing housing for rent, um, the more costly the rent will probably be, right? It's possible. I mean, certainly, um, you know, we've seen landlords, um, you know, try to work type those types of fees into rent, but ultimately they are limited by the allowable rent increases for state law. I think um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds right now because I'm waiting to hear from stakeholders and seeing what's going to happen as we move forward. Um, but I hope that we take into consideration uh, a lot of the, uh, so much has changed in, just because of between the wildfires and COVID and seeing um, insurances disappear uh, and then come back at two, three, four times the cost that we had before. Um, and then water rates will be going up at least double, if not triple. And um, so there would definitely be a lot more costs. And obviously, it'd be fair to everybody. We need to make sure that whatever we consider is truly in the best interest of people who are, um, who, who are renting and taking care of their properties and paying the rent on time and people who are um, providing the housing. So I'd be looking forward to hearing that conversation. Thank you. Other questions from City Council? Councilmember Johnson. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, the, the talk about the registry, right? There was a, a motion that passed unanimous. We voted for this as well to direct staff to start working on a rental registry. That was about two years ago, right? I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and understandably, with everything else that has been going on, um, you know, that hasn't happened. There, ha I don't think we've ever even talked about you and I, or Ms. Rollins and I, or, or anybody about what a rental registry might even look like, right? We halted that conversation when we got a $500,000 response yeah. to our RFP, honestly, because it wasn't really feasible to move forward at that time. But that was our first step in actually establishing, that was part of the RFP, was to establish a rent registry. Thank you. And I'll come back to this, and I don't want to get into the weeds, but I do want people to understand. So for example, a rental registry, I will not be here when that happens. It could be something that exempts somebody that is renting out one unit or two units if we chose, correct? Absolutely. There's a range of possibilities for a rental registry that helps to reduce impacts to small property owners. Thank you. And again, what we're talking about here is that's just one of the various things that will be explored. Can we, can we talk about something um, that is not listed as a potential option? that I think would be beneficial? Would that, that be the time to do this? I, I would welcome that. Thank you. I, yeah, what, I would, what I would ask, can we do this? Our, our prior city attorney said we could. Um, he's not here. One of the things that I think we can do, and I'd like some staff feedback on this, and this is not, this isn't going to cost the city money, but it's going to save our residents gobs and gobs of money. When somebody is applying for an apartment, they have to pay an application fee, and that application fee includes a credit check. And I know somebody who spent, you know, over $1,500 on application fees and credit checks and did not get an apartment. So would it be possible to include in this examining whether the city can act as a notary where somebody gets a credit check? And the city essentially notarizes it that it's good for 90 days and we require 
that landlords accept it as part of their application process. I realize it would take some administration on the city's part, but again, when you have some people that are paying a thousand dollars for more, essentially the same credit check over and over and over again, is that something we could explore? It's definitely something we could explore. I've never um, actually looked into something like that, but it's a very interesting idea. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I want to thank staff for all the work that they've been doing on this. You know, I have pretty high expectations on this. Um, and, and I really appreciate Council Member Alter's questions and concerns about the need for public engagement. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Other questions? Mr. McReynolds. Thank you. I have uh, four questions. Uh, or, or, let me start with confidential. Uh, so on slide four, in terms of the uh, cost of Hopkins, uh, AB uh, 1482 and SB 567, uh, I noticed in the hopes and solutions staff report, there was a rather robust conversation regarding what those mean. I think, I think it's just generally as a comment in, in this staff report, I think we should have had that same language brought over. I mean, I think we need to set the table so that everybody understands the rules that we have to operate with it. And so that, that's just a comment. Uh, on slide five, what is the planning commission's role uh, as we get down towards the second sentence there? Sure. So um, based on the housing element, this is one of the places where the housing element calls for planning, planning commission recommendations on a tenant protection program. So ultimately, you would um, do community engagement, you would return to the subcommittee, um, and then ultimately develop, um, if should the subcommittee choose to do so, develop additional aspects of the program, and then you would go back to the planning commission for their recommendation, and then ultimately bring it to council. So they would provide a recommendation as well as the subcommittee. And so and we would receive two recommendations. That's correct. For some of these overlapping items, you are going to receive two recommendations, one from the Planning Commission and one from the Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee to the City Council, both directly to the City Council. But potentially, and they could potentially be different recommendations. Yes, they could. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead to slide nine. Uh, so the community, uh, the, the first box here is a community, a Blake community workshop by November of 24. And then you mentioned that we were going to have meetings in October, November. Yeah, I, I'm getting concerned about November in, in terms of you were starting to really move into the holidays. So I would highly like to see that wrapped up by November 15th, you know, before we really truly get into the holiday season. To be honest, I'm not thrilled that we're really anywhere past the last week of October, but I mean, I understand that we need time to do this, but it, I, I would be open to considering, you know, pushing out into January, just as a, to, so that we can actually get everybody out, just as a. Our goal would be to finish by November 15th as well. We can even try to push it up a little bit. There, it's two in-person and two online meetings. Um, so we'll do our best to, to finish by November 15th, if not sooner. And if we can't finish all four by then, we'll reconvene in January. And we'll update the council as well with a consent item so that you can see what our schedule is. We'll announce it here as well. We'll do extensive outreach to the community and to the council to let them know when those dates are. So as soon as we have dates, we'll let you know to make sure we fall within that. Then my last question is slide seven. And I don't actually understand because there's no discussion about it in the staff report. How did we get here? How is $79,000 the right number? Why isn't it $250,000? Why isn't it $100,000? I mean, could we add more services to this contract? I mean, how do we know that this is without going through either the community engagement. I mean, I think we need, you know, my understanding is that uh, 567 allows us to start offering the services. Yeah, I mean, I think you um, identified a, a key issue here. We don't know if that's the exact number. We asked the Housing Rights Center how much they think based on their experience with similarly sized cities and similar situations of the types of services how much it would cost to work with an attorney on their staff to provide those services. And this is the number that they gave us. And so we're going with the number that they off, you know, bid to us, but it's, it's, it's billed out hourly. So ultimately we will utilize that contract until it is up. And we anticipate coming back to you at some point, whether it be in six months or when the full year contract is up, 
to talk about what we got for that money and then what we would need to either continue the services or extend the contract depending on the time frame. But realistically, I anticipate that we'll be back with a an amendment to this contract. We just don't know how many exact people out there will utilize this service. And until we open it up for people to use it, we won't know how much it's going to cost us. This has been a challenge of this program is that um, providing legal services to the community can be um, you know, a small amount and it can be unlimited depending on the needs of the community. So I think in this first few months, we'll be able to gauge really what the needs are and um, anticipate out as we move forward with budgeting for next year so that we can anticipate a little bit better what this will actually cost us. So is the expectation then that the $78,000 will take us to June 30? The goal is that it will. I think realistically, again, once we see what the needs are of the community, I anticipate us coming back before June, just being realistic. Okay, and my last, there's the four, four items that are listed above in terms of what is covered. Is there things that we didn't contract for that we could add based on uh, the new law? Thank you for the question, Councilmember Reynolds. So as of right now, these are the various services that are available to Ventura residents. Um, and then basically as, as staff for the Housing Rights Center, you already received the actual staff attorney, a law fellow, and two additional staff members that will be solely working on um, issues related to landlords and concerns for the um, for Ventura residents. Um, there are no additional services available as of right now. We're in a similar situation at the city of South Pasadena that also did an expanded contract with the Housing Rights Center. And basically, we're just waiting to see what the actual need is going to be. And if there's additional services that, you know, once the Housing Rights Center is already engaged with landlords and tenants, they feel those additional services, and they offer for those additional services at that particular time. But I think one key thing to know as well is that this is really to help, um, you know, most of the services that they're going to provide are going to be tenant and landlord mediation. And the goal of the Housing Rights Center is really to mediate out any issues. And what we're not providing is an attorney for tenants to go to court with their landlord. And that's that's kind of the, the piece, the big piece that's outside of what the Housing Rights Center is providing that some communities are, are considering. Is that something they provide, or is that? <clears throat> yes, so similarly, uh, what um, Ms. Diamond is referring to is a way to think of what's called right to counsel. And essentially, the Housing Rights Center in the Los Angeles County, where they're located, does provide right to counsel services to a certain population within LA County. So they do provide right to service, um, services. And essentially, they have like a group of attorneys that are together, there's about five of them as of right now, which basically help file responses to legal containers. They also represent you in court. Um, and they basically see you from the start of the eviction process through the end of the eviction process. And usually most of those cases would have legal representation due in favor of legal and behalf of the tenant. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? Um, I, I have a couple. Um, so, HRC was established in 68, is that about right? Okay, so still working. It works with, what, almost every city in Ventura County? Yes, um, as a sole provider of fair housing services, the Housing Rights Center provides services to all cities within Ventura County. There is a separate contract with the city of Ventura and the city of Oxford, but all of the other cities are part of a consortium, and they all have one big, big contract that services all the remaining cities. And so, either tenants or landlords can use the services of HRC. Yes, that's correct. Those services are all free. Okay, and so tonight what we want to talk about is, should we expand the services that we're contracting for with HRC and provide these services to landlord and tenants? And then the other half of this is for community workshops, where we talk about anything and everything under the sun. Because nobody has... I'm sorry, go ahead and answer the question, right? Absolutely, that's correct, so that we can narrow down what the rest of the program looks like. Okay, so there's an elephant out in the hall room that no one really wants to talk about, but I think a lot of people are here about, and that's rent control. But we're not here tonight to talk about rent control. We would never talk about an ordinance of rent control without going out to the public multiple times, right? To discover pluses and minuses, and as a lot of speakers said, there's people in the real estate industry that have some information, and there's some nonprofits that want to give us some information. 
correct? That's correct. Okay. And we are also going to go to um, and look at ordinances of other cities and the counties other than the ones that start with an O? That's correct. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I'm sorry, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, but I, I think you covered what I was going to ask. Thank you. That's twice today that we've covered each other really well. So I got your six, Mayor. You yeah, got mine. Time for us to leave. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Uh, pardon me? <laughs> I guess we'll never know. So uh, public speakers, how many do we have? Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have received email communications, which have been posted online, and we have currently listed 37 speakers. Okay, so I would um, like the City Council to um, entertain the idea of limiting, limiting to two minutes, but um, I'll need a motion for that. Correct. I'll second. Discussion? As, as may, mayor, if I may, I, you know, I, I will never support this, this kind of motion. If there was 100 speakers, I'd be willing to stay here, even though I expect most of them. Um, I may not agree with. I, I really want to hear what everybody has to say. And, and if we do pass this, I apologize to anybody who prepared three minutes of speaking, because according to our protocols, uh, we say if you anticipate it in more than three minutes, we suggest you put it in writing, and so um, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry if this passes. Thank you, Mayor. Other, Other questions or comments? Councilor Campos. Thank you, Mayor. I also think that on a formal item, we shouldn't be reducing time for people. It's one thing in public comments that aren't related to the agenda, but I I don't believe our protocols allow us to change the time of the formal item. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, are we allowed to move the time down from three minutes to two minutes? Um, thank you uh, for the question, Mayor. Um, Councilor Campos is correct that uh, the default rule for an agenda item is three minutes per speaker. However, the City Council will not waive vote um, uh, to waive a rule by a majority vote of the City Council members present. Um, when it is deemed there is good cause to do so based on the particular facts and circumstances involved. Um, so with the motion on the floor, if it is approved by a majority, then council can reduce the time to two minutes per speaker. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, we're going to read the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is to reduce speaking time to two minutes on this item. Okay. You can now have vote. We all votes have been entered. Five eyes, the motion carries. Okay, let's start with the public comments, please. Two minutes. Our first speaker is Gina Bush, followed by Pat Hayman. Good evening. I am a local small business owner as well as a real estate agent who served many first-time home buyers to use the homes they purchase as the beginning of a financial foundation. While I'm personally a tenant in the home I live in, I also own a home in Ventura that I rent to my tenants as a long-term rental. My husband and I were able to purchase this home to be a rental to create our own financial foundation. We're currently renting at market rate, but losing on average $200 a month while renting due to the many increasing costs that have to do with home ownership. We're happy to continue operating at a small loss because we know that over time, the equity in our investment will increase and solidify our financial stability. I am a great example of many homeowners in this community and know that myself and many others cannot afford to support the work plan as it's currently being presented. We are not dramatically hiking our rental prices or evicting our tenants and are definitely not profiting wildly off of this investment. I hope that the council will consider speaking more with the VCCAR and the surrounding communities so we can continue to be 
So we can come to a resolution that better speaks to the ability of the small housing provider like myself and the clients I work with who are just trying to create a stable financial future for their families. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pat Healy, followed by David uh, Kaishan. Hi, thank you very much for your time this evening. I'm Pat Hanley. I'm a real estate broker here in Ventura, and I have a mother of three adult college graduate students who very much struggle with affordable housing here. And um, I really want to make a difference. I know all of you do. And based on our discussion, it sounds like the city is willing to um, listen to different stakeholders, really try to be creative. And I, I hope that we all can think big, not small, in finding pragmatic housing solutions that will build trust and solve very complex housing problems here in Ventura. I think we can do it if we all work together. Our next speaker is David Kaishan, followed by Philip Fields. David Gaishan, Apartment Associations of Greater Los Angeles, representing 10,000 rental housing providers throughout Ventura, Los Angeles, and San Bernardino counties. The city of Ventura should focus on helping renters by creating direct rental vouchers for low-income renters suffering from sudden job loss, illness, or injury using the $20,000 currently allocated for the unnecessary expansion into legal representation by HRC. Rent stabilization is an extremely costly and harmful policy that is universally disfavored by economists, as evidenced by the recent global detailed analysis of 112 studies by Konstantin Holodin, published in the Journal of Housing Economics. It causes a substantial decrease in existing affordable rental housing as mom and pop owners are driven out of business, discourages new, house, discourages new housing development, and creates higher rents for the few remaining controlled units, as well as huge increases for all non-controlled units. A rental registry's fundamental purpose is to enforce rent stabilization. Without it, there is no justification to establish such an extremely costly program due to technology and staffing needs. Oxnard's recent analysis puts the cost at over $2 million. Pasadena's new program has nearly $5 million with 17 full-time staff. Free legal service is available to renters directly from HUD for fair housing issues and State Attorney General's office is investigating and prosecuting cases regarding violation of state law AB 1482 and SB 567. We encourage the continuation of HRC's existence, existing role for mediation and education, including information on these existing legal resources. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bill Fields, followed by David Estrella. Mark Reynolds, Miles, three of you, and the city attorney must recuse yourselves because you haven't hired an independent external investigator, lawyer, us in the Johnson case. You have a conflict of interest, Miles, of investigating, representing the victims and representing the accuser of saying that this is very controlled by realizing it, putting in danger the lives of the city employees only because they are black. And uh, this is a pattern of retaliation, collusion, a lean machine that quiets everyone based on what you guys do. You know, and then you lost to the teacher ethics, you're breaking those ethics, Miles, same way as Hitland broke those ethics. You're incompetent, and uh, you're violating the Brown Act by not having hired an outside to investigate why they posted this uh, lies about the employees uh, being out of order, pushing rent control, Etc., etc., fabrications that are untrue. And uh, you, Stanton, especially you, have been, in November, two months from now, you will be facing the anger of voters. You will have to answer your voters because you are being intransigent, heartless with people that work hard, city employees that work hard. Officers that work hard, 
when you have no respect to the working people, you have no trust in the community. You must resign or recuse yourself now. Thank you, Mr. Fields. That concludes your time. Our next speaker is David Stray, followed by Sylvia Flores. Uh, good evening. Um, so, to address the, uh, the housing situation in Ventura County, uh, the housing crisis in Ventura County is a symptom of a system that prioritizes profit over people. The reality is stark. Renters are being crushed under the weight of a capitalist system that has turned housing into a commodity rather than recognizing it as a basic human right. The average rent in Ventura County has soared to over $2,500 per month, meaning that a worker would need to earn uh, above $49 uh, dollars per hour, over three times the state minimum wage, uh, just to qualify to keep a, a roof over their head. Uh, the crisis is, is that coincidence. It's the direct result of a housing market driven by greed. 23 of oh, almost 24,000 low-income renter households in Ventura County are denied access to affordable housing, pushed out by developers and landlords who seek our homes who see our homes as mere investments. Meanwhile, the state and federal funding for our housing has plummeted by 80%, abandoning most the most vulnerable among us to fend for themselves in an increasingly hostile environment. 72% of extremely low-income households are now forced to spend more than half of their income on rent, while the wealthiest remain insulated from these harsh realities. And with only... We must reject this system that prioritizes profit over people. Uh, the solution lies in collective action and the fight for a society where housing is not a privilege for the rich, but a guaranteed right for all. Uh, I'm representing Ventura Tenants Union. Join uh, in the struggle for housing justice. Our fight is part of a larger battle against a system that dehumanizes and exploits us. It's time to reclaim our right. Uh, yeah, dignity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Flores, followed by Logan Clark. Hello, my name is Sonia Flores. I'm a resident of the city of Ventura and a member of Homes for All. We are asking the city of Ventura to do the following. Number one, to strengthen legal enforcement. We recommend that the city allocate more resources to the city attorney's office, specifically by hiring an in-house attorney specializing in enforcing state laws. And we also ask, uh, number two, that the city expand the HRC contract to create a right to counsel program in Ventura. These services need to be included in the HRC contract and the amount of the contract needs to be increased to accommodate this change in the scope of work. This would allow the HRC to hire a housing attorney and to have a physical location set up within the city of Ventura. The time for this is now. The city council has kicked the tenant protections can down the road for several years now. Residents of Ventura are being evicted literally as we speak for being unable to pay illegal, exorbitant rent increases. Low-income families, seniors, and Spanish-speaking families are being targeted, targeted for these evictions because they are viewed as being vulnerable and defenseless by the larger property management companies. I myself was asked to move from my previous residence an apartment complex named Buena Vista Apartments at the end of 2019 as a part of a temporary relocation that was connected to a construction rehab project that started in 2020. We had an agreement in place that I would be able to return to my unit with understanding that, the, that it would be increased by $300 to $400 per month. Instead, I was, I was notified that the increase in rent would be from $1,450 per month to $3,000 $600 per month for a one bedroom apartment. That's a $2,000 increase in over two years. And that's the end of my time, but thank you. Our next speaker is Logan Clark, followed by Judy Alexander. Is there a Logan Clark? 
Okay. okay. We'll move on uh, Judy Alexander, followed by Jacqueline and Cecilia, who's been seated tonight. Hi, I'm Judy Alexander, chairman of the Ventura Social Service Task Force, and a member for Homes for All and the Ventura County Coalition for Affordable Housing. I want to thank you, first, for being willing to talk about this topic. It's important. And what is being proposed is woefully inadequate. It's inadequate because the contract being proposed for HRC will not meet the needs of this community. There must be a means of enforcing existing law. There must be a means for tenants to have a place to go. I sit on the board of the Homeless Prevention Fund. Any emergency is causing people not to be able to have a place to live. They are paying over 49% of their income for rent. That's a different issue. But what we can do is where things aren't being done legally, we need to enforce the law. Secondly, the federal government just passed a tenants' rights bill. I wonder how we're going to coordinate, not just locally, but with now national law. There are a lot of questions. I heard earlier a number of people saying they haven't had a chance to speak. What is true is none of us have yet, because there hasn't been a time for engagement, and that is planned. And For that, I am grateful, and all of us will be involved. Thank you for your consideration. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Cecilia. You've been seated time, so you'll have four minutes, followed by Deborah Schreiber. I was wondering about that four minutes. <laughs> thank you. Um, I have to start off by saying thank you so much. I feel like everyone here tonight is more well informed um, than three months, six months ago. And I am really thoroughly impressed. I actually learned some things tonight that I had not known. Thank you so much, Rachel and Leona. And thank you so much to the Housing Rights Department in our city for the work you're putting into this. I don't think that the people here tonight who have said they've not been invited to the table understand that there is a table. And sometimes you have to push your way to the table. And that's what we did at Via Ventura. And that's what we're continuing to do, even though I am no longer a resident because I've been legally evicted because I chose not to pay my rent after I was assaulted and lost almost three months worth of work because I was assaulted by a property manager for handing out informational flyers about um, how residents' rights were being violated at Via Ventura. We have another resident here tonight as well who was illegally evicted. She tried paying her rent over and over and they would not accept it. We have another resident here tonight who uh, we have several who had to leave and they do not have any new leases. They've not been presented new leases. If um, they're being told that they have to pay month to month convenience fees, which are illegal, many residents are still paying illegal parking fees. We're still trying to determine if parking is even legal at the Aventura apartment complex owned and um, managed by Fusion Property Management. Um, our former city attorney was going to provide us a city um, contract that showed whether or not residents could even be charged for parking. However, we are still waiting to this day a year later. And again, many of us are no longer residents, but we're here because we care about the residents. We no longer have a stakeholder. Okay, so we keep talking about the stakeholders, Councilman Halter. We don't have, we're not stakeholders, but we care. We're here because we care and we know that there is an issue. And the issue is, and we're forgetting this tonight, it's, it's not about um, so many of these other issues. It's about enforcing the current laws. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for the enforcement of SB 567 and AB 1482. We're not asking for rental caps. We're not asking for anything to be imposed. We're asking for what has already been imposed 
to now be enforced. That's why we're asking for the right to counsel. As Judy Alexander said, we are not asking for enough money. We need so much more money to be able to properly serve the tenants of Ventura because there are so many tenants who are suffering from illegal rent increases, illegal fees, and illegal activities by their property management. And just by Fusion and three properties, with if you combine who Fusion owns, just in Ventura, there's over three properties. We're talking hundreds of residents whose rights have been violated. And by expanding the contract to the HRC and providing the right to counsel, it doesn't affect the realtors. It doesn't affect all these other stakeholders. It directly affects the tenants who do not have a right to counsel right now. Our private attorney, Sabrina Vesquez, specifically told us that our case was not worth enough money value. There were too many different aspects and that each value was not worth enough and that we would need hopefully our city attorney's office to take our case. Our city attorney's office cannot take our case because they're understaffed and there's not enough money that has been given to our city attorney's office to hire additional staff, specifically another attorney. That's what this city needs, like Ojai, the O's, Oxnard, and our other surrounding cities, Santa Barbara. We need the right to counsel. We need a city attorney's office that will take tenants like Via Ventura, whose rights have been violated. And that's what we're asking for tonight is the enforcement of the laws. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Schreiber, followed by Ariel Sanchez. I'm Deborah Schreiber. That's a hard act to follow. I second everything she just said. Um, I'm on the bench of the Social Service Task Force and Homes for All. I want to make sure everyone read the council people read the letter that was given to you by Homes for All. I do support the staff recommendation, but it does not go far enough. Uh, we need to expand the contract with the Housing Rights Center for the right to counsel, as has been mentioned. Also, the eviction protections um, to limit the grounds for eviction and restrict landlords to only one rent increase in any 12-month period. I, too, happen to own a couple of houses that I rent out. I do not see any of this having an impact on what I do with the homes I rent out. Um, and this is getting what's fair for people. The housing rights contract would help both landlords and tenants to, to get further information. I'm sure they would give information in Spanish. We, we assume that. And it would be advice and counsel for tenants to help guide them to understand what is allowable and reasonable and legal and what is not. And hopefully right to counsel would help them to see if things were not being done um, that were legal. I would like to call for the um, special attorney for the city that would be directed directly on only working on enforcing state housing laws. I understand the financial limits and just plead with you to do what you can. This has been a real major issue that has come up as a big priority on the list of priorities for the city. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Errol Sanchez, followed by Keanu Felix. Hello, Council. My name is Ariel Sanchez, and I'm a student at Ventura High School, and I'm here to talk about protections with Ventura, tenant protections with Ventura Locks. As teenagers, we already have a plate full of things to worry about participating in extracurriculars, sports, and studying and spending time with family and friends. No young teenager is ever prepared to face situations like evictions or housing insecurity. This has become a factor that negatively affects my classmates at Ventura High School. Worrying about a place to sleep shouldn't be a thing we teens face, but the reality is that our families can no longer afford to live here in Ventura. More and more often, families are being forced out by high rent prices and are facing unjust evictions with no policy that provides a right to counsel. This issue also affects my teachers and school staff that are not able to work and live in the city of Ventura. These challenges are not only going to get worse if we don't enact stronger tenant protections now, 
I'm here to urge all of you to take our concerns seriously and strengthen our, our local housing laws, provide the right to counsel for people who are facing evictions, and overall stronger tenant protections. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Keanu Felix, followed by Raymond Perez. Hello, my name is Keanu Felix, and I'm a local resident of Ventura. My father, who is a hardworking man that works in Ventura, struggled to ma maintain his apartment unit at Via Ventura, the place he chose to live at to remain close to my sister and I. During his time there, he faced many fee charges that inflated the price of his apartment. Being faced with these skyrocketing prices, he was not able to afford the apartment, which caused him to move to Oxnard, where the rent is a bit more affordable and find himself covered by their tenant protections. Unfortunately for my sister and I, it has made it more difficult coordinating staying with him due to the fact that he is now town over rather than staying nearby and keeping our family together. Many Ventura families often face this reality. It is getting harder and harder for families to call Ventura home when they struggle to keep their house. It is a shock to see that neighboring cities like Oxnard, Santa Barbara and Ojai all have housing policies that keep their residents' houses for reasonable rates and provides adequate protections in case of unjust evictions. It is unfortunate that our main city of the county, Ventura, has little to no tenant protections that keep our families living locally and not having them face housing insecurity. I'm here to urge you to keep families here and not have them abandon their city due to the high increases of rent and lack of renter's rights, legal representation, local housing enforcement, and strengthening our housing laws is a necessity to keep families together here in Ventura. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raymond Perez, followed by Angelica Lopez. Good evening to you all. My name is Raymond Perez. I'm a local Westside resident in Ventura. I'm here to urge you to provide strong tenant protections here in the city. I've lived here with my parents my whole I've lived here in Ventura with my parents my whole life. And one thing that I've seen get increasingly challenging for my family is the skyrocketing skyrocketing rent costs for apartments that are not reflecting the outrageous rates we live in. We lived in the Cedar Apartments on the Avenue, where the landlord did not care for his residents the way he should have been. Constantly being infested with mice, roaches, and ants. My family and I did not feel comfortable or safe living there. But what other choices were we presented with? I'm really big on being grateful for what I have because I know I'm more fortunate than others. But there's a strong line between being grateful for what you are given and letting people walk all the way because they know that is your only option. Living here during quarantine really opened my eyes to the lack of care for the tenants in the building. We kept on insisting that they do something about the problems, but nobody cared to reach out. The only response we received is that they will be increasing the rent once again. And it gets to a point where the rent gets so high, even families that are working two jobs can't keep up with it. Living paycheck to paycheck, constantly stressing about living in a place where they don't have to care less about your problems. I am proud to say I have known this affect my school or sports, but the same cannot be said about other teams who will face similar challenges. It is no secret that school attendance rates have dipped dramatically, and housing insecurity is a major factor. Families are being forced to relocate and move on from our city, or even end up homeless, which negatively impacts our youth's education. That's why I'm speaking here tonight. I strongly encourage the city council to reserve the red city staff focusing on meaningful tenant protection work plans. We need more the tenant education to survive this housing crisis. We need legal representation, and we need local enforcement to fight housing violations happening in our community, and we need to strengthen our current housing laws to keep local families happy in house. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Angelica Lopez, followed by Christian Dunas. Hi, good evening, city council members. My name is Hawk Lopez, local resident of the West Side and proud mother of Raymond, you just heard from. Um, we're both here to stress the importance of having strong tenant protections along with strong enforcement. I have lived in Ventura for 45 years, having to deal with the ongoing increase in rent, putting a stress on me and my family, having to live at those studio apartments where the landlord was more of a slumber who did not care for the units or the people living in them. Um, moving in, rent was seventeen fifty. dollars uh, The rent increased the very first year I was there to nineteen fifty, dollars and then two years later, the new owners increased it to $2,150 without ever fixing any problems the apartments had. Poor upkeep, regular maintenance were never up to local city standards, yet our rent seemed to increase without proper justification. 
because Venture has no strong tenant protection, several ranchers are having to face these types of conditions with no one to turn to for help. Eventually, the rent became too much for me to afford, which caused me to face housing insecurity because of possible eviction. For not only for not being able to afford my rent, what made the situation even more difficult was for me to take care of my children to provide a stable living situation. After being on the housing waiting list for 13 years, I was finally contacted and received a government assisted unit. But that's not to say the same for the hundreds of renters here in the city. Many of them share heartbreaking stories of living in cars and on the streets. Not only them, but the children are the ones that are most affected by the housing insecurity, causes of death in their education, making them susceptible to street gangs in the area. If you want to keep saying that the only remedy to this crisis is to know your right workshops, then you're really out of touch with the community, and we're here to provide you with that wake up call. We're strongly pushing for more meaningful tenant protection here in the city and the right. That rival our local neighboring cities like Oxford and Ohio. We cannot be the only city in the county where it neglects its citizens from making Ventura livable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christian Nunes, followed by Karma. Christian, you can see the time. You have four minutes. Good afternoon, Chair of the Council, City Manager, City Attorney, and City Staff. My name is Christian Nunez, I'm a policy advocate with COSE, Central Coast Alliance for the Sustainable Economy, and I'm a member of Homes for All, and a resident here on the West Side of Ventura. I'm here along with Ventura students, parents, renters, and homelessness and affordable housing advocates to urge the City Council to take a deeper look and work towards creating a more comprehensive outline of the current tenant protection work plan being presented today. I say this in an effort to bridge the need for strong, meaningful tenant protections to keep our most vulnerable renters housed and safe throughout the city of Ventura. State laws like 8482 cannot be the only tool to protect tenant tenants when their housing rights continue to be violated. And as of April 2024, SB 567, which is now in effect, grants our local municipalities the ability to enforce statewide tenant protections, but even then, but, um, we've seen the difficulty and challenges to the City Attorney's Office and Attorney General when presented with the tenant grievances. And since then, we've seen tenants either continue to be evicted, continue to experience unlawful rent increases or other violations, and all without the ability for our city to act as legal defense when clear laws are broken. We need legal enforcement in our city. With SB 567 in place, there's an opportunity for the city to invest in housing attorneys who have the expertise, have the capacity to handle legal housing cases and grievances that many tenants in our city cannot handle on their own. And this is because without representation, a tenant is due to experience an eviction either way. Our recommendation is to make enforcement and legal aid available to tenants today by expanding funding towards the Housing Rights Center uh, within the contract, which the report indicates that there's a budget around $80,000 to expand the current contract in the city. And although this is a step in the right direction, and I do appreciate there being a priority to extend education, outreach, mediation services, and more, it still clearly doesn't provide adequate support to keep people housed when facing serious legal issues that could impact their current housing status. And as an example, in 2022, the city of Santa Barbara created a housing, uh, a housing trust fund, and with that trust fund, uh, allocated a quarter of a million towards the Ride to Castle program. And I believe that emulating initiatives like Santa Barbara and LA County and allocating funds towards legal services like those uh, could significantly help tenants go through hardships. This could also be a case work for the city of Ventura if there's an organization like the agency that has capacity and resources to take on tenant cases. And so lastly, what we crucially need is citywide data to make sure our council makes informed decisions regarding tenant protections for Ventura. We have local cities in the county who have passed their own local ordinances to combat the housing crisis. So why not here? Why not Ventura? Why not for our tenants? Why not implement the long way the rental registry in an effort to help determine the number of tenants being impacted, which in turn could give better direction and types of protections Ventura needs. Ventura is not immune to the housing crisis, and the longer we wait, the worse off part of the tenants will be long term. This work plan is only scratching the surface for what protections are needed here in Ventura, and by taking these steps, the city can lead the way in creating a community where all residents, especially renters, feel secure and protected. Today, the housing landscape in Ventura is increasingly challenging, and with many residents facing raising rent, rising rents, insecure tenancies, and the looming threat of displacement. You know, if you all remember the results of the city survey on navigating homelessness, over 50% of the community members who took that survey want the city to do more on tenant protections. Because for them, it's their life at stake, not their business profits. 
And as a reminder, a tenant protection, pro protection program has been in the city to do this through the housing element. And these conversations started years ago. If there's anything anyone should be surprised about tonight is how long this process has been delayed. So it is crucial for our city to address these issues head on and ensure the well-being and stability of our residents. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Carla, followed by Jasmine Kim. Hey, y'all. I'm Carla, I'm a District 6 resident. Um, unlike homeowners, renters don't get the privilege of a third year fixed rate mortgage. Their housing costs can fluctuate dramatically, often with little warning, leaving them vulnerable to sudden rent hikes and displacement. Um, this isn't just a local issue, though, and I think we can and should learn from global examples, not just regional ones. I'm a proud Austrian-American, and um, most of my family lives in Vienna, which is a global example of what this can look like when done well. Um, most of my family and 60% of Vienna residents uh, live in public housing. Vienna's robust public housing system has not only provided affordable and stable homes for its residents, but it also contributes to social cohesion and economic stability, proximity to family. The success of Vienna's model lies in its recognition that housing is a fundamental right, not a privilege. The city's commitment to social housing didn't happen by chance. It was the result of deliberate, sustained effort to ensure that everyone, regardless of income, had access to safe and affordable housing. Imagine what we could achieve in Ventura if we approach tenant protections with the same level of commitment and urgency. Um, when it comes to engagement, I want to remind everyone in the room and council that 46% of Ventura residents are renters. That's nearly half of the entire city. It's 50-some it's thousand people. Um, yet when it comes to engaging and shaping the future of our city through policy conversations and things like the General Plan Advisory Committee, only 22% of GPAC survey recipients were renters. Um, so McReynolds, I'm really glad you kind of highlighted the November scheduling of these engagement opportunities, but I want everyone to do as much as they can to make sure that renters are at the table and are part of this conversation. Um, and I definitely look forward to joining us. Thanks. Our next speaker is Jasmine Cameron, followed by Claudia Arman. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Hasmeen, and I'm a resident of Oxnard. I'm here as a concerned citizen and believer that housing is a human right. I'm requesting that the council approve the tenant protections work plan and all other bullets listed under item 13. I have some economic privilege and have never experienced the fear of possibly losing my home. I have, however, witnessed the impact on students and families when there is lack of tenant protection. I've had the honor of working within the K-12 education nonprofit space both in Los Angeles, California, and East Harlem, New York. In both cities, I've witnessed luxury developers and real estate agents be active participants in gentrifying historically Asian, Black, and Latinx communities, pushing families out and unhousing our children and students, children who are our most vulnerable population. According to data from the National Center for Homeless Education during the 2021-2022 school year, nearly 1.2 million children were either homeless living in a shelter or an unsheltered location such as a car or a tent, or sharing housing with friends or family beyond a unit's designated capacity. We should be placing humans before real estate sales, business, and profit. These are human lives. The most important stakeholders here are the people who are most impacted by the housing crisis and who are at most risk of losing their home, not folks whose ultimate goal is to make money and secure power over the housing market. Housing is a human right, and I hope you prioritize tenant rights and not individuals concerned with profit while children continue to be unhoused. Thank you, council members, for this opportunity to speak. Our uh, next speaker is Claudia Armin, Phil and Matt Bello. Good evening, I'm Claudia Armin, Ventura resident and member of Homes for All. Thank you for starting work on renter protections um, as stipulated in the housing element. I am very supportive of the work plan and I will certainly commit to participating. I have several renter friends who are fortunate to have terrific landlords who follow the law and are transparent and honest. 
Landlords who operate ethically have nothing to fear from a nonprofit organization providing legal services to the tourist renters. But we also know that there are dishonest landlords. In this chamber, over the years, you have heard many renters talk about the abuses that they have faced. Via Ventura may be one of the most egregious examples, but certainly not an isolated incident. My concern about the contract for legal services is that it falls short of what's needed. The proposal includes a range of education, counseling, mediation, but actual legal representation of renters is not included. The total contract is 80000 This is inadequate. Last month, Santa Barbara approved a $250,000 contract with the Legal Aid Foundation there that includes provision of legal advice or representation to a minimum of 80 households at risk of eviction. This goes beyond counseling and mediation. Their contract that allows the Legal Aid Foundation to hire a full-time attorney and a part-time legal, legal assistant. In issue after issue, when it comes to affordable housing and tenant protections, Ventura is behind our neighboring jurisdictions. Why? It's a lack of political will, and it's sad, and Ventura renters deserve better. When something is important to you all as council members, you find the money to act. I hope that renters in our community are indeed important and that you act accordingly. And I just want to ask for that you ask the um, staff Will this contract help the Ventura? Our next speaker is Matt Bello, followed by Caroline Arroyo. Uh, Matt Bello. We'll move on to Caroline Arroyo. Uh, Jerry Becker. Followed by Luis Lampara. Hello. I get my notes, I wasn't set. I guess I should just start by saying thank you. I know it's a tough job. It's a tough job for everybody. It's a tough job for me too. Um, I am a resident of one of the O cities. I'm a resident of Ojai, and I pay a business tax here, a, uh, a license fee, and I do work in Ventura, and I love Ventura. Um, I am here maybe to present a different opinion than has been expressed over and over again. I do see some common needs from all sides of this, and that's legal representation. It sounds like we don't know what's going on out there. I know there's landlords that don't know how to operate under the current state laws. I know there's tenants that don't know how to operate under the current state laws. So I think in both directions, that could be a resource. Um, we're talking about um, an issue, the housing crisis, and basically the root cause of our housing crisis um, is increased demand for housing. I mean, we have increased demand for housing supply, and um, experts are saying not to put additional pressure and restrictions on the market to fix it. That's the bottom line. It's an expensive endeavor to be a landlord, a property owner, and we have been facing many, many extra pressures economically. Higher insurance, we all know about that higher taxes, higher maintenance costs, costs um, added restrictions from our local jurisdictions, and, you know, just trying to get through all of the hoops and bounds, and it's very tough, so I would encourage you to all look at both sides of this. Look at both sides and support the housing providers out there. You don't need to, like, continue. Thank you. Luis Amparo, followed by Adele Trier. Good evening, Louise Lampera, Ventura County Cola. There are many people here tonight to speak on the content and impacts of this item. So I'd like to use my two minutes to ask the council to consider a much needed process improvement associated with this and other items tonight. 
As you consider this matter, it's critical to note that statements in multiple staff reports have created serious misunderstandings. The report suggests that the subcommittee approved tenant, a tenant protection plan when it's been clarified now, tonight, that no such plan actually exists at this time. Decisions must be made based on accurate and complete information. When the decision-making process is compromised, even if by mistake, the foundation of our public hearing process is put at risk. The public relies on the transparency of this process to trust their elected reps are making decisions based on facts, not misunderstandings. Transparency is not a buzzword. It is the cornerstone of effective governance. When there is disagreement and confusion with not one, but two staff reports at the same hearing, especially when these reports conflict with the video recording of the subcommittee meeting itself, the city has failed to uphold its duty to the public. And the trust that the public places in this body has been eroded. Public trust is fragile and very difficult to rebuild. So I propose a process improvement moving forward, not just at the city council, but at all subcommittee, not just the council, but subcommittee members, staff, and the public must understand and agree on what exactly and specifically has been voted on. I recommend that immediately prior to any vote at any city public meeting, council, or committee, the clerk or appointed scribe must read the motion in full and post the motion in full in writing on the public screen. This simple process amendment not only increases transparency, it will avoid future confusion. But thank you. Our next speaker is Adela Trader, followed by Julio Gomez. Good evening. Hello again. Um, yes, real estate agent. Yes, property owner, home provider. But first and foremost, a community member of this our beautiful Ventura. Um, I really appreciate hearing all the speakers tonight because you do start to hear some things that are sounding like enforcement. Uh, a lot of things that are mutual education, education, education on both sides. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I hear in the field as a real estate agent. Anyone who thinks this housing situation is simple is very misguided. This is across the state are housing issues. My question, and sometimes when I, when I hear, you know, some of the responses is, but why does it fall on my shoulders or on the shoulders of the home provider? I get that housing should be for everyone, but it isn't entirely the housing provider's, uh, you know, issue. It is all of our issues. We have issues at the city that we can talk about that perhaps can, you know, fix some things. So housing, yes, uh, but not necessarily just on the backs of one party. Um, we definitely have some enforcement issues. What I'm hearing in the field are people that are aren't aware and that they're afraid, property owners, that they're just going to sell because they're frustrated, because they don't know. And yes, it is an investment. It's their retirement. And so they're afraid. And so they just assume sell because they don't understand and they're afraid. And also people who are looking for housing, who are struggling, who have been in their rental for a long time, but because they're property owner is uncertain and afraid they're going to sell. And so now they have to leave and find new housing. So I deal with, with all of them. We're, we're right in the middle of it. And so I do look forward to those conversations. I do see a lot of, uh, you know, collaboration uh, between the groups once we understand each other. So well, thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Julio Gomez, followed by Brian Zell. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Julio Gomez, broker owner of property management in Oxnard. We take care of 12 properties here, and the owner is Mount and Cloud. It's the retirement money. We don't need more fees. We don't need more registration fees because we know the collateral effect. It will pass it on to the consumer. As I hardly point out, everybody's complaining about the rents. They're pretty high. If you added another layer in, the, in the, this expensive housing, what's going to happen? The people we want to protect is the people that are be more affected. So let's go think, let's go invite everybody to the table to find a solution for our community. I live here more than 26 years. 
I don't want to see my kids go away because they look like they can't afford it. All my kids, they want to stay in Austin Aventura, but they think they ask me that. I can't afford it $3,000. I can't afford it $2,500. So what are we going to do? Let's go put our minds together. Let's go help our community. This is a great community to live here, but we don't need more fees. The AB 14 and 82 or AB 567 has enough. Let's go apply the laws. We don't need more laws. We don't need more fees. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Zell, followed by Matt Caputo. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Brian Zell, and I am a resident of Ventura. I moved back here about nine years ago, towards the end of 2015. I'm also a tenant, and I'm also a real estate agent. So I understand the anxieties involved in being a tenant and what can happen to you. In 2017, I was displaced by the Thomas Fire, and I was one of the lucky ones to find some place to live fairly soon, within a few weeks. And it was rental in Midtown. And for the first three and a half years living in that, that house, I uh, took care of it like it was our own, paid rent all the time, and then the owners in the increased the rents. And then the owners and the property manager got word that the um, <clears throat> Tenant Protection Act is coming in October. And they started increasing the rents legally within what they could, but every single year my rents would increase, increase, increase for three years in a row. And when I asked the property manager why, it was because of the anxiety of the, prop, of the property owner, realizing that if they didn't keep up with the rents, um, they wouldn't be able to, if they chose to sell it or anything else, be able to sell it at market value. So, Mr. Halter talked about unintended consequences. These tenant protection acts will have unintended consequences. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Caputo, followed by Kim Inside. Good evening. Once again, counsel. I don't, I, I don't want you to forget about the small time housing providers like me. I worked my tail off here without an education to, without a formalized education to have, to build a business, to have a rental, to own my own home. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not. And there are hundreds and hundreds of homeowners, landlords, housing providers, just like me. And if you leave folks like me out of the conversation, I think you're making a mistake. I would be very disappointed. I would be one of the first to sell and get out of the business. And I've already had some of my owners say to me, should we sell them? That would be a shame to, to leave that, leave those owners out of this process. As far as the housing rent center is concerned, where are the stats? We're going to spend seventy-three thousand dollars. I, I don't really understand. The county has staff. Somebody has to have staff. Hmm? Nobody can spend seventy-three thousand without knowing where they're spending the money. You know, Santa Barbara has a uh, robust rental housing mediation program. That's not even on the list. I think it's a shame. Uh, it works. It's functional. Uh, it's an alternative. And as far as application fees are concerned. Some great ideas that, yeah, that we should share. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kane Pinsack, followed by Jorge De Leon. Hi again, Kami Pinsack, VCCAR 2024 president. Uh, we work daily to address housing challenges 
and we believe that the proposed tenant protection work plan will not solve these issues, but instead exacerbate them. Economists from across the political spectrum agree the key to addressing housing prices is increasing supply, not imposing more market restrictions. Ventura already has strong tenant protection under state laws like AB 1482 and SB 567, which balance the rights of tenants and property owners. And these laws are working. Evictions are coming to their lowest level in 12 years, and the rental market is stabilizing with a healthy vacancy rate. That being said, and what I'm hearing is we support additional code enforcement resources and the hiring of a new city attorney with land use and tenant right expertise, as well as rental assistance programs. It is worth noting that VCCAR and other key stakeholders have been repeatedly held out of the process. Moreover, staff rhetoric appears to have biased the conversation, creating the impression that rent stabilization and tenant protection ordinances are foregone conclusions rather than proposals still under consideration. This not only undermines trust, but raises issues of procedural fairness and puts the city in a precarious legal position. We encourage the city to think big, not small, and consider more collaborative approaches like mediation programs that have been successful in nearby cities. If the city adequately enforced the current state laws, a lot of the people telling their stories here this evening would be at home watching TV and eating dinner with their families. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jorge De Leon, followed by Leon Waldman. Good evening again. My name is Jorge, and I am a resident of Ontario. I was actually uh, been living in Ontario since birth, with the exception of a couple of years as a teenager. Um, with regards to the enforcement of this rule, this is, you know, specifically you know, 567, we're here really in support of the enforcement of the current law. Okay. Adding additional scenarios that would you know, make uh, you know, rental housing investment not attractive to new investors is going to actually really lower the amount of rental housing availability in the city, which is going to make the situation even worse. We're going to come back and ask them for more tenant protections at that time. So my, my ask today is that when the work group gets together, that we're not biased, that the group is not biased when it comes to really, really engaging in the community. Because based on some comments that were published in the local newspaper uh, on the 17th, which was about 10 days ago, they make reference to certain ordinances that were actually established in our neighboring cities. They actually quote a percentage. And there's a big, big danger with having a specific percentage that is not driven or that's actually much more uh, restrictive. And I'm going to point out to something that is quoted in the work plan under the proposal. And I'm worried that it's going to try and mirror or try to bias the, the community outreach to really look into those ordinances that would actually make this much more harder for us to enforce. So I'm all for the... Uh, the funding of the program for so the additional enforcement, I have no issue with that. But any, you know, illusion or any, you know, consideration of an additional protection plans, you know, rent control issues and so forth, I know that I've been chastised not to use that word here by one of our members here, but the reality is that if we're not careful, we might just go that route. Thank you. The next speaker is Ann Waldman, followed by Karen Flock. Um, I'm Ben Waldman. I'm a 33-year resident of Ventura and a homeowner here in the lovely Clear Point neighborhood. Um, so I'm here representing Ventura County CLU, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. We're a network of people from uh, congregations throughout the county who are working against the grave uh, inequalities, economic and racial, in our communities. And we're also a member of Homes for All. Much of what I was going to say has been said by my colleagues from Homes for All, but I do want to underscore that I, when I saw $79,000 uh, to support um, legal services, it just struck me as very strangely inadequate. Um, so, when we hear that Santa Barbara has put $250,000 into their contract for legal services, we need to keep in mind that 
Santa Barbara is a city with 30,000 fewer people than Ventura. I also want to raise the issue of a, a dedicated attorney, because all, the, all the, the list I saw of what was going to be provided was mediation at best, but people need legal representation. And it would be best if that was happening in-house in, uh, in our city. And I just want to say, as a homeowner, as a secure person, I'm still a stakeholder in this issue. I'm deeply concerned about my community and of the quality of life here for everyone. It doesn't do me any good, my family any good, when people are living with extreme housing insecurity. Our next speaker is Karen Flock, followed by Stephanie Caldwell. Good evening, Mayor Scherzer and members of the City Council. My name is Karen Flock. I'm a resident of Ventura. I support the staff recommendation. Almost half of Venturans are renters. They're, the median income of renters is significantly lower than that of homeowners. They are more likely to be minorities. Over half of renters are cost burdened, meaning that they spend over 30% of their income on housing costs. Many renters are facing significant rent increases and other issues. We need more affordable housing, and some of that is in the works, but it's going to take a while, and it's important to take what action we can now to assist renters. It's important to do in this plan to look at increasing protections, particularly legal representation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Caldwell, followed by Lucas Zucker. Good evening. I'm still Stephanie Caldwell. I still work at the Ventura Chamber. I'm also a resident of Ventura. Um, the Ventura Chamber of Commerce has been a strong advocate for housing at all levels for many, many years. The number one issue that we hear from our members is that attraction and retention of employees is unduly challenged um, by the lack of available and affordable housing. Tonight, we've heard a lot of emotional testimony and the real struggles of many of our neighbors. The truth is we do have a housing crisis, the results of which we are trying to navigate here. You as the council did not create this problem or this situation, yet you are tasked with helping to develop solutions. The state laws AB 1482 and uh, SB 567, as discussed, already protect resident renters. We must also do a better job of educating residents on their rights, but also property owners on these laws. I hope that there will be significant consideration in the discussions on just that issue. I also agree with the hiring of a city attorney specializing in housing issues. I also believe that the expediting of housing development should be strongly considered in this. The housing crisis and lack of available housing is really only going to be solved by an increase in, in supply. We also believe in the very strong enforcement of the current laws. If a property owner is knowingly breaking the law, they should be held accountable. Any one of us could fall on hard times, and there's no shame in that. We need to strengthen the safety net that is available when this happens. Expansion and possibly consolidation of rental assistance programs would certainly be a great place to start. I urge you as this moves forward to do so with great clarity, communication, and transparency. As Councilmember Johnson says, the outcome is never better than the process. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lucas Zucker, followed by Rebecca. Thank you, Council Members. Um, Lucas Sutter, co Executive Director of Cause. Um, housing experts talk about the three P's production, preservation, protection. We need all three. Uh, I've served nearly six years on the Planning Commission. Our city has approved nearly every housing development that's come before us and done streamlining. Um, you know, but production is part of the solution. But as Karen Flock and no one in the city knows more about housing than, than Karen Flock said, those things take years. And tenants at risk of losing their homes need relief right now. Um, Tenants have come to ask for stronger tenant protections, like in some of our neighboring cities, like Oxnard and Ojai. Um, you know, others, uh, landlords say that we just need to implement state laws. So let's, let's have that debate in, in October, November. Um, but 
At the very least, we need to be putting our money where our mouth is and implementing those state laws. Um, the single biggest gap in implementing state law is that here in Ventura County, when tenants are facing uh, a violation, they have simply nowhere to go. Uh, there's no agency in charge of this. You can't go to the police. Uh, you need a lawyer. 90% of landlords have lawyers, 97% of tenants don't. And in Santa Barbara County, LA County, there are strong legal aid programs for tenants. Here, when tenants come to cause, we have nowhere to refer them to. Um, we can create a right to counsel program like they have in Santa Barbara for 0.04% of our city budget. I mean, it's budget dust. It, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's, it's really not. And the beautiful thing about a right to counsel program is it helps both landlords and tenants. Um, my message to counsel is to do something. Uh, whether we're going to pass our stronger protections or we're going to implement what already exists on the state books, um, we can't afford to do nothing. There are too many people who grew up in this city who have had to move away. There are too many families who can't afford to raise their kids here and our schools are losing enrollment. And there are too many people every day losing their homes and ending up on our streets. Thank you. Our next speaker is Navanka, followed by Kyler Carl Carlson. Can you hear me? I'm just a hard working construction worker, and I've seen Many dilapidated rental properties. Have you ever heard of the real page? Have you ever heard of the real page? You're a can of landlords that are raising all your rent. They're being investigated by the DOJ. Have you ever heard of the real have you ever heard of the real page? Have you ever heard of the real page? They're in violation of the Rico Act. Have you ever heard of the real page? You're being investigated by the DOJ. Our next speaker, Kyle Carlson, followed by Karen Hoffer. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I brought no instruments, and I apologize. Um, my name is Tyler. I'm here tonight speaking as a resident of District 2 and as a renter. I support the expansion of the HRC contract, though if we want it to be a meaningful policy for homeless prevention, then I think it needs to be much stronger and include some form of rate to counsel. Many others have already given vivid testimony about the necessity of this. Just please keep their testimony in mind as you deliberate tonight. Law-abiding landlords should not be scared by tenants who are protected. It's not a zero-sum relationship. Rights for tenants does not mean less rights for landlords. So please consider expanding the HRC contract today. On the second, second part of the action that you're considering tonight, the work plan, I support council getting started on dealing on drafting a tenant protection ordinance. No less than three council adopted Plans have already directed council and staff to address these concerns, the housing element, the homelessness plan, and the 2024 housing council rules. For those of us whose futures to live in the city feel dependent on these protections, it feels like it's taking way too long. Before we get to draft an ordinance, we absolutely need more engagement. That's been clarified tonight. Um, there will be plenty of engagement. The housing crisis is so severe that I think you should be considering all policies at your disposal. That's policies to encourage the supply side and policies that help keep folks in housing that is affordable to them and minimize, minimizes the displacement pressure facing them. 
I'd encourage you to look at tenant protections from the lens of homelessness prevention. Through my volunteer work with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul at the Mission, I personally assisted a couple currently living in the River Bottom who was a tenant at the Mission Hotel prior to its renovation in March of 2023. Those units are being converted into luxury apartments that are now being leased up for $2,200 for a studio. I'm out of time, please. Our next speaker is Karen Hofford, followed by Shana Steiner. Hi. Um, I really wasn't going to speak, but one of the things that I think is really important to note is that our housing shortage is probably one of our problems. And the unbelievably difficult process of getting a permit and the extreme cost of getting permits is probably not helping us to create affordable housing. And I think maybe it's getting better now, but I think it's time to address that side and make it a little bit easier and less costly for people to create affordable housing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shana Steiner. Shana, you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Alrighty, um, I will start off by saying landlords maybe get a different occupation. Maybe actually don't depend on a weird source of income that depends on exploiting people like those you heard from tonight. I'm so inspired. Um, I know I'm not there in person, but to have heard from all of you tenants who are organizing, and I want to urge everyone to form a coalition tonight and to talk to everybody. Um, I am definitely for a motion as a tenant that increases tenant protections, um, which is for some reason like the boogeyman to all of you landlords. I can't believe you're, we're not even talking about a rent cap. Like, I think that you should take a breath. Um, but one point that I wanted to expand on was that the rental registry should be made publicly available and the owners of LLCs should be clearly identified. Tenants should have the right to know who owns their homes so that they can collectively organize um, and struggle across properties. I also wanted to touch on the woman, I'm so sorry, I forgot your name, but who so aptly pointed out that legal workshops will not liberate us in our housing struggle. I couldn't agree more. Um, again, we need to be organizing. So having transparency across properties paves way for that and obscuring it and letting it landlords sleuth behind the scenes um, definitely feels deliberately like trying to stand in the way of tenant organizing. Um, so yeah, um, please unionize. Please talk with everybody there tonight. I wish I could be there. I'm so sorry. Not um, Landlords, read it and we, we are going to unionize. Um, good night. That's all. Our next speaker is Janet Spitzler, followed by Mitch Lilly. And Janet, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, you can. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, for your time tonight. I hope you took some time while during the break, because man, this is a full meeting. I'm Janet Spitzler, broker owner of Rent 805, representing over 45 property owners in the city of Ventura. I think it seems that there is agreement that SB 567 needs to have enforcement before another program is completed that also won't be enforced. Education is so badly needed for all. Council Member Johnson, I'm very concerned about that application date that you talked about. Applications cover more than credit checks. They cover ID fraud, pay stub fraud, income to debt ratio, income verification, employment verification, and previous housing verification. These programs are costly and not an income generator for us housing providers. In fact, our policy is uh, anyone we do not even look at their application, they automatically get refunded back. We, that's just not an income generator for us. So anyone who pays $1,000 for 20 applications, which is $50, is a red flag. There's more going on there, and they would have had to have that information on why they were denied 20 times. For housing holds property management to follow laws and applications based on date and time of applications, and they're very high. Regarding the rental registry, if you own over 
for units in all the cities that we work in, we pay business tax for all housing providers. On top of that, the state automatically takes 7% of all those rents from all, doesn't matter how many years you have, takes them all. And then there's the disclosure of private information of tenants that seems really overreaching. Uh, a tenant does know who their landlord is because it's listed in their lease. It's right in there. So with that said, currently in Ventura County, we have 1,983 units, and 430 of them are in the city of Ventura. Two years ago, we only had 400 units. We are seeing prices coming down, and we hope to see what kind of education and the board working with us. Thank you. That concludes your time. Our next speaker is Mitch Lilly. Mitch, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, thank you, members of the City Council. Um, my name is Mitch Lilly. I'm a renter in the City of Ventura, and I'm speaking to you today as part of the Ventura Tenants Union. We're a grassroots organization dedicated to advocating for renters' rights and housing justice in Ventura County. I acknowledge the Council's efforts to address homelessness through tenant protections. I think this shows the understanding of a critical issue in our community and brings these two issues together. Um, in particular, the proposed rental registry is a positive step, and we agree with the previous comments that the right to counsel is desperately needed for tenants as well. Uh, but many of the measures currently fall significantly short in addressing the severe housing crisis in the Detroit County. Uh, according to the CHAS data from 2013 2017, uh, about 53.5% uh, of city of Ventura rented households are cost uh, and that's, uh, you know, 58% are actually experiencing some form of housing problem, whether they're cost burdened, lacking a complete bathroom or bedroom, living in the garage, or where multiple tenants are forced to share. So the uh, proposed tenant work plan, you know, it's a great, it's a great step in the right direction, but it's a very small step. It would really only cover about 1.6% of those 10,000 roughly households that are experiencing significant housing problems. And that is very likely that there are many more that, that, that would benefit from that, uh, from that help. So uh, we really urge the council to accept this work plan and to take more robust action in the future. The current tenant protections are woefully inadequate to meet the scale of the problem. There's a housing crisis. Um, and yeah, I wanted to mention as well, you know, like some of the other special interest speakers, you know, I'm not paid, I don't have a fancy outfit on, even when you can't see it. Um, I'm not any pay, um, I'm a volunteer, just a tenant, tenant for many tenants uh, with the same kind of stories. So, um, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes our public speakers for this item. Back to the council, council member Campos. I want to remind our colleagues and everyone in the room and the staff, many, pe many people among the speakers mentioned their focus on Senate Bill 1482, and followed by 567, which is billed as uh, resolving the loopholes of 1482. Um, a study done by Ventura College students, having seen the number of high school and college students who are homeless determined that 40% of the student or of the renters in the city of Ventura are not covered by Senate Bill 1482. They're too small under the law to be covered by that. And those are tenants. They're, they're the mom and pop landlords, and those are the tenants who are most in need. And that's why this public engagement will be so important. And that's why I support this 100%. Other comments? Councilmember Johnson? Thank you, Mayor. First, you know, I would note that um, every everybody that spoke tonight had something worth hearing. Um, there was a little problem, though. I don't think we saved much time and cutting time down to two minutes. But some of the speakers who had the most to say were forced to rush through their comments. And that makes it difficult for me as a policymaker when honestly some people are, are forced to speak too quickly to get through that material. Um, you know, when I was campaigning, I had a conversation with 
Dr. Mark Lepore. I was hoping he would support me. He's the medical director at, at Santa Paula and a Ventura resident. And he asked me a question I was not prepared for. And it was a good question. But the question he asked me was, why are there so many poor people? And, and so, so I, I took, took my time, time and I thought about it. And I just, you know, yeah, I gave what I thought was a very blunt answer, which, which is because that is what our system is designed to do. The fact is we have a system where vulnerable people can be exploited for profit. And this colors every decision that I make. It's unfortunate, but that's, that's where it is. Now, to go through some of the things, uh, Carbo, you know, I was just in Vienna for the, for the Taylor Swift concert. I will tell you, you know, the, the, the tickets to that, I got for my birthday a year ago. We were looking forward to it. I had special shoes. Um, but the concert was canceled because of terrorist stuff. But so one of the things we did when we were in Vinny is we, yeah, was, we went to the social house. We went to a bunch of different places to, to look at it. So certainly I'm familiar with it. We're not ready for social housing. We're not ready for rent caps. I think we all, all acknowledge that. I'm familiar with Real Page, Neuronica. Um, for those of you that don't know, there are allegations that landlords were illegally colluding to keep prices high. I have never had the sense that that happens in Ventura, that there's some sort of pollution. Um, as I've said in the past, we have some fantastic landlords here. The overwhelming majority of landlords in this city are good people, and they are not exploiting anybody. And there are some landlords that are bad. There are some tenants that are bad. I, all of you landlords out there, I would never take that on myself. I just, I just wouldn't do that. Now, I'm absolutely in support of what we have here. I agree with Dr. Alexander that this is woefully inadequate. Some of the discussion we had came about when we had problems with residents who were, by all accounts, having their rights under state law violated. It wasn't just via Ventura. Cause reached out to me for somebody mayor in your district that was having trouble. And I worked with the city, and the city's response was, we can't really do that. Our city attorney's not authorized to take this on. They couldn't get an attorney in the time that they needed to be able to get an attorney in, a, in an apartment that was filled with mold. Well, they had to move. I have seen this with the renovations that we had on the avenue. I called around trying to find a lawyer that could just give them some advice. I finally found one from Barbara Macri Ortiz, who is some of you may, may remember, you know, one of the lions of tenants' rights in the county. She's now retired. She got me in touch with somebody that was willing to take it on for a very small amount or even no amount. And unfortunately, uh, the residents um, and understandably thought that, well, if, if some attorney is showing up and offering to represent us and they're not giving us the bill, something's fishy. But it, it was me. It was me. When Mr. A. and I met the residents of the Aventura and heard what they were going through, I took it upon myself to try to find them an attorney. It never happened. I can, I can go through all the calls and emails I sent, and so many, so many attorneys that you know are somewhere in the area that say they got specialized in my tenant rights. You call them up and they're just they just said we do not represent tenants, and it's understandable because you know if somebody is looking at being evicted because they're not paying an illegal rent increase, there's not a big pay. There just isn't. Absolutely, we should have a contract with the HRC. So, 
how we got to the contract with the HRC was because I was one of the people saying, let's, we still have never done it. We have never authorized our city attorney to take this stuff on. All we have to do is just authorize them. And it gives them the authority. We've never done that. But so when I was saying, as Stephanie Caldwell from the chamber suggested, let's bring in and let's have an attorney on staff that can deal with these things. The response was, we could do that, but it would actually be so much easier if we went with HRC. And so for people, Mayor, I, like to, I thank you for pointing this out. HRC works in over 100 cities. You know, this is not, this is, this is not some fly-by-night organization. I trust them when they come up with a, a, a dollar figure for what they think. What I would do, though, and, and I'm going to hear from my other colleagues before we do a, um, a round with motions. I think that we should proceed with this to direct staff to, to come back with an agreement, and I'm just going to say $150,000 for legal representation of counties. We have heard, especially from people who maybe didn't read the staff report or heard about it, secondhand about how we already have all of these state laws. We do. But they're not being enforced. We as a city, we enforce state laws all the time. We enforce state traffic laws. And the city goes to court representing the people. It's not a stretch for the city to make sure that state laws are being enforced. If we had tenants, attorneys, it would be a different discussion. But CRLA, they can take on maybe 5% of the people who call them. And so for me, when somebody comes to me and says, look what happened to my rent, look at these fees, and and I'll give you an example. You know, when the, when the landlord says, well, that's not our interpretation of 1482. Well, we just don't think it applies like that. And every attorney, including staff, say that's not how they see it. Well, what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? This is something that lots of other cities, it is something we can do. As somebody pointed out, you know, landlords that are following the laws don't need to worry about this. If it costs a lot of money, I want this council to think about this. If offering a right to counsel costs the city three hundred or four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars, what then is the extent of the problem we have with renters having their rights being violated? And what is the cost to the community? Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Other comments or thoughts? Mr. McReynolds? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to ask staff on the topic of enforcement. So we've heard a lot of, uh, from the public comments in terms of lack of enforcement. Is, is that a code enforcement issue, or where is this enforcement? So when we talk about enforcement related to housing, it's really... Uh, through legal enforcement. So just as an example, state law limits the amount of um, rent increase you can do on an annual basis based on CPI and, and an additional percentage. And so let's say that someone um, were to go beyond that, for example, this is really enforcement through an attorney or legal services to basically put the landlord on notice that they're in violation to work for mediation, et cetera. Um, that's really the way that we see it versus a code enforcement issue from our own staff. But we had people talking about code enforcement issues. Where are we as a jurisdiction in terms of enforcing just the building code? Oh, in terms of enforcing the building code, we have um, a staff of code enforcement inspectors that um, effectively um, work throughout the city, mostly on a complaint basis, but also proactively to enforce a wide range of regulations from building code to zoning ordinance. And so we have a team of four right now that are out in the field doing those things. So do, do the tenants uh, that are having issues know how to get them in touch with code enforcement? 
So if it's a if it's an issue related to zoning or building and safety, our current food enforcement team can help with that. But if it's something related to, for example, um, violation of state law, our food enforcement doesn't. Um, I'm not getting into state law. Yeah. Yeah, so they can call our city and file a complaint and get in touch with food enforcement for any issues, like, for example, some of the um, physical issues that some buildings are having, like tenant uh, termites or um, physical damage. So how often is that that happening? And what is our response? So um, it's not that often that we have issues from tenants going to code enforcement, because, again, I think most of the time they're looking for legal services. When they do come to code enforcement, we follow up with inspections, talking to the landlord, and dealing with um, trying to get the issue rectified first. And if it's not, then we issue citations. And we continue to issue citations until the issue is dealt with and addressed. So, and, and what does the issuing a citation beyond the fact that you're giving me a fix it ticket? It's a, it's a ticket that has a fee associated with it. And I'll, I'll be honest and say that similarly, one of the issues that we have is ultimately when, it, um, you know, after multiple tickets, um, if the issue still isn't addressed, we can, um, we can deal with getting the fees um, in certain ways. But in order to actually get someone to comply, we need to take them to court. And what we're missing as well from a code enforcement standpoint is the uh, resources to um, use outside counsel to go to court for a lot of these issues. That's where we stop the process. What is the fine? Um, the, the, the ticket fee? Uh, I believe it's uh, between $150 and $200 per ticket. So what would prevent us from exploring billing to 1000 or something big in that way? I think we could with the amendment to the code related to penalties. That's, there's nothing stopping us from that. Is there any reason that we wouldn't charge what I was going to continue to call the Hopes and Solutions Committee reviewing that as part of this process. We can certainly bring that forward. It's a little bit outside of the purview that we discussed previously today, um, but certainly related to housing issues. We, you know, we can couch it as that and talk about violations related to housing and, and talk about potential um, fee amendments. And I think we just have to be reasonable in that fee. And then in terms of, uh, well, I mean, just to kind of close it out, I mean, I don't understand why we wouldn't do strict enforcement, you know, in terms of we have a code, as uh, Councilmember Johnson pointed out, you know, we enforce all kinds of codes, uh, you know, we, we should be zealously uh, doing that. Um, in terms of the uh, HRC contract, when does that, assuming if it got approved tonight, when would that? So um, that professional service agreement with the Housing Rights Center will go into effect September 1st, if it's approved tonight. So next week? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then, so looking through it, we're budgeting about 1,040 hours for case management, uh, to have two case managers work on. Yes. So one staff attorney, one um, law fellow, and two case managers. So would it be realistic you know, in terms of, you know, assuming this gets approved tonight, that we could get an update in January in terms of where we are with this contract. And if it, if, you know, is it actually making a difference? Uh, you know, I think as part of this larger conversation, you know, do we need to bring an attorney uh, either on staff, you know, about that time, we'll start our budget discussions. And at the same time, you know, hopefully we have a new city attorney. And, you know, we can have that larger discussion. But would it be realistic to get an update exactly where we are in January in terms of going through this contract? Absolutely. And we can also bring it to the subcommittee as well, just to have it on record and make sure that people can see the both locations. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions um, regarding the HRC. Um, we currently have a contract with HRC, yeah? Yes, that is correct. And so this um, 80,000 would expand to specifically do the outreach by HRC? So as of right now, we have a contract with the Housing Rights Center for $10,000 because it's a requirement of federal regulations that we provide fair housing services. So the additional um, funding for this particular contract would include like the mediation services, the outreach and education, as well as, um, you know, we, we 
in person and virtual workshops that they're going to be doing in clinics for us. And it also accounts for all the staff time and resources. And prior to having them do all of that, does any data exist in terms of um, uh, lack of enforcement or where enforcement is needed most or um, the number of uh, residents who require the assistance? Do we have any data that indicates where we're at with that? Um, as of right now, we don't have data specifically for that because as of right now, the housing rates center is solely focused on fair housing services. But they do receive a number of phone calls and inquiries via email as well from tenants and landlords seeking information about general landlord tenant rights and responsibilities. So that is something that we can obtain from the housing rights center and report back to council on. And just for clarification in regards to um, the legal representation that has been mentioned, with that, then let's say we go that round. Um, I'm assuming Councilmember Johnson's um, uh, possible recommendation of 150,000. Would that be for legal representation? And if so, like how would that be worked through with HRC? Like, what are some examples that they've done in other areas? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so one other area to talk about specifically is for the city of um, the city of Los Angeles. So for the city of Los Angeles, for their right to counsel program, um, it's called the um, it's called State House LA. Um, essentially, what they've been doing is that if a tenant approaches them and they say, like for example, you know, under AB four C eighty two, my rent increase should only be ten percent. I got a forty percent rent increase. Then they go ahead and write a violation letter to the housing provider, and then if the housing provider does not respond to that violation or refuses to rectify that illegal rent increase. That's when they will then do some type of legal action against them and some type of just proceeds throughout the action to go court. Hmm. Okay. Um, and who normally, we, we talked earlier about fees, um, who normally sets the fees uh, in this particular case for a violation? Would that be the HRC? Or is that codified somewhere in state law? Or? So there, we have local um, fees associated with violating our rules for these violations. The fees come from an alternative to the other. Yes. So if there are violations, so either a what happen is that that either they will utilize whatever the city currently has in place in terms of violations. But typically, when you're thinking about violations that it's you know that involves like like rent increases, you know, change in terms of tenancies that don't abide by state by state law. Typically, they set like a violation fee that's a little bit substantial. Sometimes they're ranging between five hundred to up to fifteen hundred dollars per violation. Okay, thank you for my questions. Um, I have a couple. Um, I'm getting a sense from us that uh, we can't solve all of this tonight. Um, so when I listen to my fellow city council members, I'm hearing. Um, Maybe you need to come back to us with a, uh, uh, a later date on uh, fee structure examination. I would say stricter enforcement and then costs for uh, legal representation. I'm, I'm not sure um, that we can come up with that dollar amount tonight, but I sure would like if you came back. I'm ready to support what we have in front of us tonight. But I'm not sure it's enough. Um, but I would appreciate it if staff would come back and give us some recommendations or some options on some of those. Would you like us just to clarify things, Mr. Mayor? Would you like us to come back after we engage with the community or before? Yeah, uh, Lori, I want you to come back quick, but you can't get to the community quickly over and over again. But I don't, I, I'm not sure that. Uh, the seven of us want to do this independent of getting feedback from the community. Um, I'll leave that to the rest of the city council to discuss. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Durant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thanks again, Scott, for all the information. And I, I want to thank our community, too, for all the, the input. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, we're paying ten thousand dollars a year right now. I'm just curious. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you just report of what how many residents use their services over a year. Um, do you have those numbers? So, as of our current professional services agreement with the Housing Rights Center, 
they are um, designated to serve a minimum of 100 residents and that includes both landlords and tenants. And do they serve that? Yes, that is correct. I mean, right now that's what they're serving? Yes, that's what's being projected. We have not received their final report for fiscal year 23-24, but it's being projected that they have served a, a minimum of 100 residents. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm ready to make a motion if, if that's okay. So I, just a couple changes um, on item A. I'd like, I, I'd like to, um, so we have A, B, C, and D. C and D are absolutely fine. On the item A, I'd like to say approve public outreach um, instead of what we have as a work plan, because that is the work plan we're going to public outreach. And then in item B, uh, the verbiage would just include all stakeholders and residents of the city of Ventura. So, so we just include all stakeholders in there and support the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. So, Council Member um, Duran, just to straighten it out, on item B, are you saying authorize the Housing Rights Center to provide to all stakeholders? Is that yeah. where you so you read, read the whole thing through all stakeholders, tenant counseling, mediation, education, workshop, fair housing services for, um, for all residents and stakeholders in the city of Ventura. So just adding the two together. Okay. Questions? Council Member uh, Halter, then Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you again, staff. I just want to mention that, you know, we all know that uh, we have a huge problem. As we started out earlier this evening, that uh, housing, affordable housing, uh, is in the, uh, our housing bell curve has been significantly broken for a lot of reasons, and um, we have to fix it. And um, I know that part of that problem is the lack of ability to build housing here and the limitations we artificial limitations we put on for many many years and we're paying the price for it and i also feel that the process itself we know that 25 to 30 percent of the cost of every new home is the process and the holding costs that all adds up to a much more expensive house and a larger mortgage there's also um, building the same stock home over and over again instead of having the bell curve of entry-level housing mid middle income albeit expensive middle income housing um, and higher end housing all of that's very important for a sustainable community and we have pretty much destroyed that balance over the last 30 or 40 years and we have to recreate it and unfortunately a lot of the young people the people just starting out are really paying the price and that's why we're becoming an older wealthier community unfortunately we're only wealthier because our houses are worth a lot of money but if you're here to stay you're not here to move to texas or arizona or nevada or places with much larger carbon carbon footprints than in california um, then we don't care how much your house is worth, you know? And we only care if you're going to catch out and someplace else. So we have issues, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. What we talked about tonight um, is about um, getting uh, outreach, outreach from all members of our community, uh, from all the, all the stakeholders. And yes, tenants are absolutely part of the stakeholders. We can't be naive about that. They absolutely are a huge part of it. So... So that has to happen. What we're doing tonight, um, there's some things that I think are almost no-brainers. I think things like the $79,000 contract uh, for HRC is, um, is a must. I think that's something we should do. And I think that uh, Councilman McReynolds said it hit right on it. And he said, come back in December or January with probably January and see how we're doing and see if we need to refund it, you know, add more funds to it. Because I bet you a lot of us would. Um, there's other things like that, that enforcement. Enforcement, again, why do we make laws that we can't enforce? You know, whether they're state laws, local laws, or county laws. Uh, it's just, it's frustrating. It makes a lot of us look like fools. Um, but we can't enforce the laws um, in, in a consistent way. And especially when they're harming people and their ability to live here. And so those are things that I think most of us um, would, would agree upon. I get concerned when we dive too deep into this. If we start talking about um, rental registry, if we start talking about uh, rent stabilization, if we start talking about, well, those are the two biggest ones. They absolutely cannot be decided until we go out for um, 
for all the stakeholders to have that point, that chance at the end of the table. We have to hear all the pros and cons, and I have the utmost faith that we could come up with the fairest and best way forward, knowing that we all know we have a great quality. And uh, so with that, if there's a motion, I, I am concerned, I will say this, this motion on the table. I mean, when I see things like the homelessness plan, that is part of what we're approving tonight, right? And that's on page three to five. Okay, enforcement of current law, hope and solution subcommittee, the rental register. So that's already approved? Tonight, tonight we're just um, approving um, the HRC contract as well as, I mean, that's really the main thing, and the option. Okay, Councilor Mr. Walter, for, for clarification, the motion on the table adjusted recommendation A. So instead of it being approved, the tenant protections work plan, it would just be approved uh, moving forward with the public outreach. Okay, perfect. Then that I just wanted to make sure because I've been caught on this early on when I first got elected four years ago. So I'm cautious. So I want to make sure that um, that. Everything that I was just reading off is part of the, the tenant protection work plan. It's not attached to B, C, or D. If that's the case, then I'll support the motion. Um, that is my understanding of the motion if the motion maker could confirm as well. That, that's correct. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, just so everybody understands what our current contract with HRC, we have one of the smaller contracts, um, but it's it's for fair housing really under federal law. This is for people who feel that they've been discriminated against on the basis of being a member of a protected class. Um, one of the key differences in what we're talking about is offering the services of HRC to everybody, whether or not they're in a, in a protected class. And then, of course, things such as mediation. I will note that you know, my expectation is that mediation should reduce any litigation that there is. Um, and going to court, the, the, the letter saying that we're going to go to court over what our attorneys think is a, is a violation of state law is, it's a, it's a pretty big stick. It's a pretty big stick. The question about the data intrigues me. No, we don't really have that. And when we went through this, the answer to not having the data is the rental registry. If we want to know how often this happens, we need the rental registry. Landlords are not going to come to us and tell us that they've raised the rent 14%. And some of our most vulnerable community members are not going to either. So I will not be supporting the motion. Can we go back to slide nine, please? So this is what we're talking about, and this is what has been stricken from the motion. Um, all of this has been replaced with community engagements. In these future actions, it starts with community workshops. The motion says, well, we're just gonna not do the other stuff before even having any the community engagements. You know, council has to evaluate a rent registry program because there is an outstanding directive from council and if my colleagues want to change that, then do. But we can't have council directions sit for years and years and years. It's not fair to staff. It is not fair to Ms. Rollins. Ms. Rollins, many times, <laughs> many times, I'm like, what about the rental registry? And she can't answer it. So with that, Mayor, I will be making a substitute motion. I will move staff's recommendations plus E, direct city staff, direct the community development staff, whatever, direct staff to return to us with uh, a cost and the details of a contract with HRC providing legal representation through the end of the fiscal year. I will not put a date on that. I will, on a side note, Mr. City Manager, advise you that you're going to need about eight meetings during the month of January with all of the things that Council has told you to bring back in January. 
Um, but, you know, one of the great things about working with HIC is this is their bread and butter. This is what they do. They will have a really good idea. And so, again, my motion is staff's recommendation plus return to us with the information about providing legal representation. Thank you, Mayor. Is there a second to that? Second. Discussion on that? Um, Mayor, can I ask one Please. clarifying question? Um, Councilmember Johnson, uh, you noted staff's recommendation. So you would keep um, <clears throat> recommendation A of approving the work plan. Okay, thank you. A question is, is slide nine considered the work plan? That's what would account for item A in the recommendation, yes, is moving through those steps. Okay, uh, any, yes, Mr. Yeah. Halter? Just for clarity, so everything that I read earlier is now included back into this motion. Say that again? All the items I read earlier that were part of the work plan are now back into this motion. Set up the motion. Yes. yes. Including the rental registry, including looking at um, rent control. The the, the work plan is shown on the, the screen for future actions to clarify. Um, Councilmember Halter would include working with the community to determine what next steps would occur, including a potential rent registry, as we show here, but it could be any number of programs. At this point, engaging the community would allow us some blank slate to decide what's moving forward. In addition, rent registry has been on the list of items from City Council, so we anticipate including that, but certainly we'll work with the community to determine you know, with, with their input, what we move forward with towards this group. So, Ms. Diamond, this is um, to come back with um, information on those items. That's, That's correct. correct. No, it's not approval of those items. It's coming back for information in January. It would be conduct the community workshops in October and November, and then come back in January um, to uh, our excuse me, Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee, and um, then we would also engage with the Planning Commission and come back to Council with those recommendations. Okay. Just bringing up the fact that when we did the housing element, we approved something very easy that a lot of us like most of it, but there's definitely concerns that need to be vetted on some of those items uh, in, the, in the housing element. So they're put in there as things to be looked at. They were not put in there as things that we must do. And that's that was clearly when we did that three years ago. So I wanna make sure that we're not changing the direction. So I could support this if it's coming back to share information, okay, on um, a way forward. Hopefully we'll have some public input on before then. That would be part of that way forward. And uh, then some final um, uh, stakeholder meetings to make sure we feel fully vetted. I doubt three to six months is more than is not is enough time to fully vet. So, are you looking for additional um, community engagement beyond four workshops with the community? You think you could do four within the next three months? Absolutely. We'll do two in person and two virtually to make sure that we can allow the most attendance. We'll reach out. Um, with a huge effort with our um, community engagement team um, and communications team to make sure that people know that the meetings are happening. We're looking at other ways to engage with the community to make sure people understand whether it be mail or who's adding to your water bill, any ways we, yeah. which we can get to people that don't normally show up so that we can hear from people who are typically part of our processes. Okay. I guess I look at being a realist to some extent and my optimist most of the time. But the fact is, is that um, knowing what we went through with GPAC and trying to schedule, especially around the holidays, which we're about ready to enter, um, it became extremely difficult. And so uh, I would probably put a stipulation that all four workshops are done before the GPAC goes in. Okay. Anyway, that's a friendly, friendly um, amendment. 
Uh, I, I don't see a need for an amendment because, you know, there's there discrete steps. And so you don't have things coming back to council um, according to this until June. I think that's plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I see that there. But I'm wondering, do you have um, just complete, complete community workshops by November 2024? And I don't see four workshops there. So we didn't include the number, but it's in the staff report and in the presentation as well, with two in person and two virtual. Can the deputy mayor and Mr. Duran? <laughs> I just. Um, Excuse me? No. He's not. Oh, did you go ahead? He's there. Oh, well, I just wanted to, because um, I, I hear what you're saying, Ms. Diamond, in terms of we'll have these community um, workshops, we'll get input from them, but, but I also feel like this, this sets the stage and this sets the tone for the direction that the city would be heading into um, prior to even engaging in those community conversations. So I'm just trying to understand um, if we go this route, I mean, our, our, our can we change midway if we need to? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand that because I, I just feel like we're saying we're having community input, but we're saying this is the agenda for the community input. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the tenant protection program, um, as we discussed previously, has been um, recommended in a number of documents for the city. So we've had this, um, this program in the works for quite some time, and we've been looking at what other communities are doing and looking at what tools they have in their toolbox. And realistically, there's, there's a limited set of things you can do, right? There's kind of the top 10 things that communities do um, to work to help with tenant protections, right? And so I think that we have kind of the, the, the maximum amount of things that we could do and under an umbrella of tenant protections. I think you heard a lot of those things from the community. You heard them from us. I think there's a lot of fear around certain um, aspects of that. Mm -hmm. And so what we anticipate doing is talking through all these things with the community, first setting the stage and helping them understand what conditions are um, within state law, within local law, and what we can and can't do so they understand kind of the limits of what tenant protections could be, but then ultimately engaging and getting meaningful feedback, some of which we've really gotten tonight. So this mm -hmm. actually was super helpful as well to hear from people what works and doesn't work and engage with them on the details about that. So if we were to um, use certain tools that we know work in certain communities, what does that look like for Ventura and how do we make it specific to the city of Ventura? and our residents and our other, you know, landlords, stakeholders, and the community at large. Whatever recommendations that we um, come up with from those um, workshops, we'll then go back to the housing and homelessness sub subcommittee and talk through those recommendations and really start to form what is a full work plan and, and kind of a full picture of the program and also start to talk about some of the details, like how we could potentially fund such a work plan, again, mm -hmm. depending on how mm -hmm. complex it is. And so at that point, we still haven't formalized well, anything because ultimately you're the final policy decision makers here. Mm -hmm. so, so nothing will be set in stone until we come back to council for final adoption. So at any point in that process, um, they're getting input from the subcommittee, going back to planning commission, speaking with the community, and then coming here, Anything uh, related to that could change. Ultimately, if you decide to add or subtract program or policies or programs within this larger program, we can absolutely make those changes. And things change and conditions change. And so, you know, six months from now, something may um, come up that is a brand new solution to this issue that we can also tackle. So if something new comes up or someone comes up with a new idea, we're open to making changes at any point. And I think what's helpful is our staff is extremely flexible and they're extremely knowledgeable in a wide range of housing issues. So some of these things we see as potentially being able to take on in-house. And then there are other things that we can reach out to the broader housing, um, you know, advocacy community, at the legal community to help us fill those gaps. So we really have the ability to pivot however you want. This is your ultimately your decision 
And I really want to highlight that. This is your decision and, and not staff's decision. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the concern that we're doing this behind closed doors, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and fortunately, is not accurate because ultimately you make whatever decision that you see fit for the community, and we're here to implement that however you would like us to. I appreciate that. Um, thank you for, for saying that. Um, and I think lastly, I would just uh, recommend that um, funding, uh, there be a discussion on funding these programs, um, especially because it's a state-driven directive. Um, you know, is there state funding? Is there other funding that we can look at um, in terms of being able to uh, implement such program? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McReynolds and Mr. Duran. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Deputy Mayor. Mayor. Thank you for your comments, Councilmember Council Halter. Um, I, I think you know. I know. I know where you're. What you're talking about right now. And I, I want you to know that what I'm looking at right here, it says complete community workshop in November. Awesome. Present workshop feedback to Hope and Solutions Committee and gather recommendations from subcommittee January 2025. Then we jump right into. Analyze and evaluate a red list. What if, what if in that information that we got, they don't, all of the stakeholders, all of the residents don't, don't want a red list? What if they say no to that? Now, here we are in February talking about that. And it's, that's why I said, let's do the public outreach. Let's bring it back to hope. Let's go from there. But we're adding these things that we, we didn't, we didn't do at the hopes committee meeting. What we said at the hopes meeting is we're going to, Pay for this, and we're going to um, we're going to do public engagement. That's what we said we're going to do. And so I, I won't be supporting this. Mr. McReynolds. So I, I kind of want to walk through a couple of the, the items. Uh, so we had, when, regarding Main Street moves, we asked that the survey be done by August 31st, and my understanding is that. So you believe that the November 24th, having community workshops done by November 20th, let's call it November 15th, as a hard date, can be done? Absolutely. The, the, work, the point of the workshops is for them to be um, the same, so that you only need to attend one of the workshops so that we can reach out to the most amount of people. And so that'll be helpful in creating a program and again, being able to schedule it pretty quickly. What we can do is get the meeting scheduled so that our next city council meeting we have dates to announce and we can follow up and include that in a consent item. Um, and that'll be one additional way for us to reach out and make sure people know about those dates. So then in these community meetings, tell me about the bilingual, how that's going to work. Well, I, I can't speak to how we, we haven't crafted the details of how the meetings are going to work, but we'll have um, a translator available uh, at a minimum. And um, we, I think we um, see the need for um, if we could have one meeting that's specific to Spanish speakers as well. And so one of the um, in-person and one of the virtual meetings could be more focused on speaking in Spanish as the primary language. And then um, English as the translation for those who want to attend, if that um, could work as well. Okay. So that's an option. Um, again, we haven't finalized the details of this. We were hoping to get endorsement of the meetings and then move forward. Initially, we anticipated hiring outside, um, outside consultants to help us moderate the meetings. And that may be something that we continue to do um, just to have um, the ability to help you know, work through all of the comments. It sounds like there are a lot of people interested in coming to these workshops and providing input. So we want to make sure that we can engage with all of them. So moving on to the second item, uh, this will be my big ask. Is One of my concerns is we've got the election. We're going to have two new council members and then the hopes committee is going to reset. So I feel like we're starting like, over to a large extent uh, in terms of that. So then because you're, you're talking about bringing back in January to an entirely new committee who hasn't had any of the other information. So it seems a little bit unfair in terms of that. So my ask would be if, if the, the new mayor would, and if the current hopes committee members would be willing to serve another year to consider that. 
because I, I think that would help expedite the process. Uh, but again, that's not something that I can really ask. So it's more maybe a consideration uh, here. And I, I appreciate the comment. It's it's definitely something that we deal with as staff and the turnover of elected officials, particularly on these types of subcommittees. Um, in the event that there are other council members that are serving on that subcommittee, we can definitely make the first meeting of that subcommittee of a new group um, a um, a catch up meeting where we provide a lot of additional background information as well. Should anyone need more information about what we've been working on, our programs, etc., so that they can get up to speed. Okay, moving into the third box. So you did an RFP. And it came back at a half a million dollars to do this. We heard an inordinate amount of people coming up today talking about this. So this thing has to be done perfectly. And so you decided we're going to bring it into this. I, I don't understand how we believe we have the expertise to do it internally on something that is obviously going to be scrutinized to the nth degree by all parties. Why would we bring that in house? Well, I think the um, project management of this program it has been brought in house, but there are certainly um, not only opportunities, but with the example of HRC, we're utilizing outside services because we don't have that expertise in house. So all of the legal services are happening outside of City Hall, as an example. Um, with the rent registry, initially part of the work plan that was presented to the subcommittee was that we would go out to RFP to get someone to start working on the fee evaluation and determine a program fee. And ultimately, the subcommittee wanted us to pause on that until we engage with the community. But that as well would be, should we move forward with something like a rent registry? Um, we do have the ability to create a physical um, app in-house. So our IT team is incredible, and they can build out a rent registry program where it's web-based and you can go online and it would be something that's actually very reasonable for us to build out internally. But the establishment of the fee would be, for example, something that we would want to consult with um, our fee consultants that we work with on an annual basis to update all of our fees and create new fees. That's something that we don't have expertise in house. Again, I remind you of the situation with paid parking where staff did its own study and it was torn apart. I, I, I'm very hesitant to go down this, this road with staff. I don't, I don't feel like we're setting it up for success. Um, on. I, you know, I, I definitely hear the concern. And, um, you know, again, I think uh, looking at holistically what it would take to go outside for someone to create this program, the only response we got was for $500,000. So if we wanted to go in that direction where we completely farm out 100% of this, that's what we're looking at financially. I understand. And then uh, I'm just going to jump to the last one. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to use the word preordain. It, it sounds like we're preordaining the outcome uh, by the, the approving this uh, tonight. And I apologize for that. It's a it's draft ordinance if needed, right? So some of the things that we, um, you know, that we conceptualize as tenant protections would require an amendment to our municipal code, and others don't. Um, and so if whatever we decide on um, and whatever the council um, direct staff to do requires an ordinance, then we would come back. Otherwise, it could be a resolution. It could be just a motion from council or approval of a contract or other things that also bring this program together. So it'll be kind of a range of things depending on what we end up with. It's certainly possible that um, you know, we could engage with the community and they um, want less of these programs, and so it would be, you know, engaging at a minimal amount to, you know, again, some of what we've heard from the community doing a lot of, you know, right to legal services would be um, kind of on the higher end of the program. Okay. Uh, Mr. Durant, I have a, uh, so you're uncomfortable with the third box. Would you be more comfortable if it said complete analysis and evaluation of final options and recommendations, I'm good with the first two boxes. The first two boxes. You're, you're struggling with the third box. Yes. So, yeah. so instead of that language, the substitute language, I would say it might be an option would be complete analysis 
an evaluation of final options and recommendations. Yeah, that's perfect because when we get it at the, at the HOPES committee, that, that would be the next step. And, that, and I'm fine with that. Okay, and the only suggestion I would make is make that March, not February, because I don't think they can do it in 30 months kind of given. Yes. The, the warning we're getting from Mr. McReynolds, which I think is appropriate. Absolutely. And, and I'm good with that, but we have a motion and a second on the table already. Okay. Would, would somebody accept that as a friendly amendment? Cool. It's, it's a different motion. So, so my motion is the one that's on. And no, no, that is, I would, I would not accept that. Um, just so we could be clear, could the clerk please restate the motion? Yes. So, Councilmember Johnson's motion is to move staff's recommendation plus direct staff to return with cost and details of a contract with HRC for legal representation until the end of the calendar year. Or fiscal, no, the fiscal, end of the fiscal year. year. Fiscal year. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yes, Mr. Halter. Yeah, for reference. And this is a, uh, the substitute motion. So the original motion is, if you could repeat that. Come back to that. Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. I want to know what the original motion was. So Do you have the original motion? Yeah, I can. This is the previous motion by Council Member Halter on the screen. Got it. So uh, Council Member Duran's motion was to approve um, staff's recommendation with two edits. One to uh, recommendation A um, to approve the public outreach aspect of the tenant protection work plan, which in in the staff report is known as community workshops. And then um, to make a small edit to B, to read the final couple words, to read and fair housing services for all stakeholders and residents of the city of Ventura. Right, but, but what we're voting on, can you read uh, Mr. Johnson's motion, please? One more time. Yes. Yeah, sure. so, so that was to move staff's recommendation plus direct staff to return with cost and details of a contract with HRC for legal representation until the end of the fiscal year. Okay, are we ready to vote? Let's, Let's vote. Okay, so we'll be voting on Council Member Johnson's recommendation. You can now your vote. Vote fails. Five nays. Is there entertain another motion? Mayor, I would like to make a substitute motion. I, I, I've got Mr. Duran and then Mr. Johnson. We have the we have the motion on the table right now. My so the substitute motion, Mr. City Attorney, and perhaps to be clear on this, we had the motion. The substitute motion failed. There is now room for another substitute motion. Uh, that is a good question. You may have to give me a second. I have another the circumstance, all right? Or there's no limit to the number of substitute motions. So, do I have another substitute motion? Mr. Duran, is that what you wanted to? Oh, mine's, mine's still there. He wants to do another substitute motion. Okay. I am making another substitute motion, and that is in the staff's recommendation. Is there a second on that? Second. Discussion? Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to clarify, clarify a couple things. First, nothing in the housing element is optional. Those are all things that we committed to do. I voted against the housing element. One of the things I said was there are all these programs in there Council does not understand the implications of the cost of these things. And you voted for that housing. And one of the things you committed to was to hold public hearings with the Planning Commission to review options for tenant protection policies that counter the effects of economic displacement in early 2024 with commission recommendations forwarded 
to the city council by July 2024. We are far from behind on that. I note with great disappointment that when we were talking about opening the, the foul weather shelter more often, that one of the arguments why we shouldn't do it was because then we'd be opening it more often than we committed to in the house. We can't use our housing element to like pick and choose for our agenda. And I have said so many times that we need as a council to have a budget document come to us just on the housing element, like the CIP, with timelines for implementation and costs spread out. Because some of these things are expensive. This is one of the things I talked about when I explained why I could not support the housing unit. That some of these programs that were really agreed to in two invitation-only closed-door meetings, that was the extent of public outreach, these things were promised in order to get support. Okay, but so we have it. It's not bad. We're behind. We can fix it. What I find disquieting is, yeah, there will be a change in council. There will be potentially a change in the hopes committee. But what we're doing here with council member Durant's motion is putting a gag order. You are not allowed to use these words. We talk about community involvement. Well, don't look into this one thing. As I said before, there is an outstanding directive by council and it's not a commitment. It's not. What there is is a great fear of even talking about. Again, tonight, where's the data? Well, let's get the data. It's, it's something we can do. I will tell you that the rental registry, the rental registry, when I wrote that policy consideration on rent evictions, it was Peter Gilly that wanted the rental registry and said, we can do this. This is not something that staff is incapable of, of undertaking. And I have faith in staff that this is something they, they could do. You know, $500,000 sounds like an incredible amount of money. I don't think anybody's talking about spending that type of money. But what has never happened yet in all these two years is staff has never come back to us and said, realistically, this is what we're looking at. This is, this is what the burden will be on staff. This is what it's going to cost on staff time. This is what it's going to cost in outside council. And this is the timeline. And given council that data before making a decision. And so I have real qualms about shutting the door on something for a future council. We talk about community outreach. And now we're afraid that the community will tell us to do this. So what we have here is staff's recommendation. If you want to change, you know, it, it has analyze and evaluate a rent registry and program fee by 2023. That's one option for all the things that we need to do according to the housing element. According to the housing element, I guess we're skipping the planning commission or we're going to involve them. It's one of a number of things. There's also in the, in the housing element, a thing about the right of first return, which is another policy we have not really discussed. It's a whole suite of tools. Why council wants to prevent even a discussion about one of those tools that a prior council wanted to do seven zero, I, I, I find troubling. And if council wants to kill the rental registry, then council needs to kill the rental registry and stand up and stand before your voters and say that you oppose the rental registry without even hearing what it might cost or what the timeline would be. I know some of you have had sit downs with people where they tell you this is the worst thing to ever happen. It is for landlords who break the law. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Duran, can I, um, it, it, if there's significant feedback in, in the workshops that we have, and some of that feedback is rental registry, then 
we, we would have to perform an analysis on that, correct? Mr. Mayor, I, I have no problem with that. It, we, we want the feedback. We want the information and whatever it comes out, it comes out. But based on how it's written, it seems like we're already, we're already there. So you're not saying hell no to the registry, you're just saying that's okay. correct. So that's correct. That's, yeah. Yes, Mr. Halter and the Deputy Mayor. I was gonna say is that you know, it, it's been it's interesting because you know, we could paint any picture we want to paint and some of it can be true and some of it can't. We've been watching that for years at the national level and I see it's fair as well. But the reality is is that you know my mistake was believing that the housing element would come back to us. And this is a previous step. It was before all you guys were here. But it was supposed to come back to us. In GPAC, it was it was made to uh, hit um, a state time period to get it in there in time. And then it was made to come back for us to review it again and make modifications. Okay? So it's not about picking and choosing. As a matter of fact, we put everything that homes were all written out because a lot of it is really good. But we need to have that conversation. And God forbid that we want to get all the stakeholders at the table to discuss this. So I'm not saying no to the uh, to the rental registry. I'm saying I want to hear what the stakeholders have to say. Because quite frankly, I know for 15 years I've given all the information to this city for my my first home that I ran out that happens to be a tractor. Okay, so I know they have that information already. So it's not about that. I just want to make sure we're not du duplicating our efforts and not. Asking people who are working hard trying to make a living and trying to live here and trying to create houses for people that need houses, okay, and, and pay for their own mortgages, that we're not making it impossible for them because they're busy filling out paperwork in the bureaucracy. That's the an harm. And that's something that I've come to really despise as a governor. I need things to be efficient. I need for a time well spent. The thing I know very clearly is that life is very short. Every day is important. So what we do needs to be purposeful, it needs to be succinct, it needs to be efficient, and it needs to be not redundant paperwork shoved across somebody's desk because somebody wanted to track that data. So I resent the fact that we're painting a picture that we're missing true. The fact is we have time, and I would agree with Councilman Duran, I would not be voting for another motion that's, that says staff recommendations and doesn't say it yet all the stakeholders' information first. So that's where I'm, I'm going to stand. So if you keep doing motion after motion after motion, so we're here to three in the morning. But I will not be supporting it. <laughs> and if it doesn't say it's stakeholders' right, information. Councilmember Campos. So responding to my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Halter, um, you, if you look at what we're being presented, it starts with engagement with everyone, and then it moves through the steps of what we have told our staff to look at. And those things will be discussed in the engagement. If we take any one of them out, it weakens the entire process, and it's a slap in the face to any community members who want to participate in engagement, engagement, about that item. It's like saying, oh, you know, you can talk about everything, oh, but not this. So it's, it's kind of taking a control and tying the hands of the staff. It, there's nothing that says we have to do that. It just is one of the questions that's being asked. Deputy Mayor. I'll call for the vote, please. That it requires a vote, I believe. A call for a vote. There's a yes. Yeah, so we had an original motion, and then we uh Councilmember Duran's original motion and a substitute motion by Councilmember Johnson. The substitute motion failed, and then Councilmember Johnson um, moved another substitute motion. So I believe that we are on that. However, I will defer to the city attorney to clarify or to overrule. That is correct. We will. Uh, vote on the substitute motion, the second substitute motion. Could you please uh, read that motion? I yeah, the it. second substitute motion by Councilmember Johnson is just to approve staff's recommendation. And there was a second on that motion? Yes, there was. Uh, Councilmember Campos. Okay, ready to vote on that, please. 
You can now enter your vote. All votes have been entered. The motion fails, five nays. So we're back to Mr. Duran's motion, is that correct? That is correct. Yes, Mayor. Further discussion on that? If not, we'll vote. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I have a substitute motion. I'd like to move Council Member Duran's motion and in addition, uh, direct city staff to bring on a staff attorney uh, in the city attorney's department devoted to uh, housing and the uh, housing legal, legal issues and, Is there... and do that by March 1st. Is there a second? I second. Discussion. Council member Johnson, uh, could I ask a clarifying question? I expect so, yes. Um, it was to uh, to evaluate bringing on um, an no, attorney? No, I find the money and do it. To, to bring, bring on an attorney by March? By March 1st. In the in-house attorney? An in-house attorney in the city attorney's department. Expand the city attorney staff at one. Make whatever necessary changes there are to the budget um, for an attorney to focus on these issues. And I want to thank Stephanie Caldwell for her support on this. I don't need to, I, 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 don't, I don't want to put words in Ms. Caldwell's mouth, but um, I appreciated her support of the general idea. Questions, Questions comments? Let's, Let's vote, please. Oh, oh no, no. It's fine. Mr. Halter, but these work the screen working is a little bit difficult. Um, how would that impact the HRC? Would it be in addition to funding the HRC? I yes. assume that's the yes. that's the yes, that is correct. That we would still move forward with the, the contract for the services proposed, so up until uh, mediation. Um, so the community would still be getting those services between uh, now and March. And then after that, um, the city would provide the additional uh, legal services with an in-house attorney. And we have the confidence in knowing, and I have not seen any data to back this up, but is, do we have the confidence in knowing that there is enough workload to support a uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars a year lawyer in-house? Um, Where's the data? Thank you. Councilor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I think that question would have been directed to me. Um, it's a little hard to say without a rental industry, isn't it? Yeah. It's a little hard. <laughs> You're son. Okay. Okay. If there's no other comments or questions, we'll take a vote. I just want to make a quick comment before we go. You know, we're going to be having a city attorney. So that might be something we wait on before we move forward on something like that. Okay. Vote on the substitute. Yes, this is the third substitute motion to move uh, Council Member Duran's motion plus uh, the addition to bring on a staff attorney to address the tenant housing and legal issues uh, by March 1st, 2025. Okay. You may now enter your vote. All votes have been entered. The motion fails by these. Mr. Uh, Reynolds, I have a substitute motion. Um, I would like to have the uh, HRC contract uh, added to this in terms of bringing forward a report in January on the status and at the same time expanding the potential to expanding the legal services um, at that time. Uh, that would be brought before the Hopes and Solutions Committee in January, and then brought forward to the full council thereafter for full consideration, along with the community feedback, or community outreach on how to proceed in the uh, February and March timeframe. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Um, is, is the wording the same on anything else? And we're taking the bottom off that. 
last line that we that just failed with the attorney. Yes. yes. Okay. I'll say. Discussion. With so, oh, Councilor, just to clarify the motion, um, this is Duran, Councilor Duran's motion, but with the mod, the addition that uh, we report back on the HRC uh, contract in January. To Hopes and Solutions. To Hopes and Solutions. And then, and then, and then to the full city council thereafter, and including a discussion of uh, an analysis of whether the how best to fund legal services? Correct. Right. And, okay. and the cost. Yeah. The, the whole. Thank you. If there's no questions or comments, I'll go to a vote. Vote, please. You can now do vote. vote. We're waiting on one vote. All votes have been entered. Five eyes, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Public communications, do you have any cards, Mr. City Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we do have seven public comments. Let's get started, please. Our first speaker is Evelyn Arnold, followed by Nirvanica. Uh, Evelyn Arnold. We'll move on to uh, Nirmanika. Okay. Um, is Terrence Foley in the room? Okay. We'll have Terrence Foley followed by Jorge De Leon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I know it's been a long night, it's going to be real short. I'm Terry Foley speaking on behalf of the Pierpont Bay Community Council and wanting to thank Mayor Joe Schroeder and the city manager, city attorney, uh, members of the <clears throat> city council, and especially um, Monica de la Hoya for the progress on the short term vacation rental ordinance. I'm understanding that that could be in front of the planning commission in October. And I know it took a lot of work, it's been a long time. So thank you very much for your effort. Especially to you, Good night. Our next speaker is Jorge De Leon, followed by Glenn Dolan. Good evening again. My name is Jorge, I'm in District 2, 205, you're getting into this. Just uh, expressing something. I've actually been coming to the city council meetings for a long time, remember. Just went back into the history and so forth, and there's been a lot of public discourse and, and such. I'm very, very, very disappointed with the fact that this is part of the public discourse, our participation as citizens of this town, of this city, and our ability to be able to address the you know, written letters and so forth. And for us to get negative feedback or even be chastised, you know, it's very intimidating to come and speak to you guys. So I'm very disappointed as a whole that our ability to come to you and speak to you on issues that affect the community. Ten years ago, we were talking about the water issues. We spoke about how conserving water was actually ended up raising our rates because we were saving so much water that they couldn't keep up with the safe, you know, how much water we were saving, we couldn't keep up, so the water rates went up. We spoke about it. We've been talking about housing issues. We've been talking about so many things, but I'm just so disappointed that some of my fellow you know, volunteers that, you know, speak on certain issues that have to do with housing for all and get the negative response in writing, negative response to that kind of stuff, almost to quiet us, is very, very disappointing. So I want to share with you guys, I do not like how things are going with the city council when it comes to our ability to speak to the matter, to speak to everybody. It's not one side over another. Give us the ability to speak freely about the subject matters without getting, getting a negative response prior to us coming to you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Glenn Overly, followed by Patty Overly. Just some uh, quick housekeeping. Bill, you must be clairvoyant. You said we were going to have two council members replaced. There could be three. Just a thought. 
Um, city manager, great job by Derek Keeley, and Joe had filled in for a little bit. So appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. All right. A, a council member said something that kind of caught my ear. Building trust. Then democracy was set. And then a few minutes later, we were going to talk about the amount of public speakers that were going to talk on the item we just talked about. And then we limit their time to two minutes. Is that the building trust that you're talking about? Is that the democracy you're talking about? The speaker that was just before me, essence of the same thing. I'm not going to get very many opportunities to talk about the two ballot measures, so I'm going to do it every opportunity that I get. So ballot member P is in Papa. The gender neutral language, completely understand. The other changes to the charter, I completely understand. Hiding, compensation for council members, not building trust, guys. It's in the very bottom of that text. That's not building trust. And then tying that to the standards of general law, cities, that's going to be, as I understand it, kind of done through perpetuity because you've said as the population increases, so will council compensation. As a voter, I want to vote for any raises compensation that council gets. That's my right. The other one, measure Q, or I'm sorry, ballot measure Q. Taking the voters' rights away during the absence or vacancy. Again, I would rather vote for somebody. And what I, what I did today, just by accident, is I looked at Santa Barbara's city charter. Section 503 under vacancies. I hope the two ballot measures that you've provided the citizens, I hope they both fail, but not because I don't think some changes are needed. I don't like the language that you use. I think language closer to Santa Barbara is more appropriate. And I wish that you would have mimicked that a little bit more. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patty Overly, followed by Spencer Norn. I'm not going to speak about the ballot measures. Um, I'm really disappointed in what happened tonight for the tenants' protection. There were two things. Well, first of all, over the last several years that I've been attending, we have had multiple times where those same tenants on the west side have come before this council begging for help. And you have all said, oh, we got to do something. We got to do something. You know, it's like watching a ping pong thing with you guys sometimes. Then you have an opportunity to give some legal money and you fight over that. And that's for, Doug, you said in your comments, why do we make laws we can't enforce? It, it was, was told to you not to make why. Why, why did, did you even ask that? that? It was told to you multiple times. And, and then, then you have the opportunity the mayor tried to start it, and then Mike had, he went with Jim's plan, but added that caveat so that these tenants Minnesota, would... Uh, I just want to remind you, you're speaking on an item that was on the agenda tonight. This period is for items that... Okay, so I'll try to leave it to a general, the behavior of the council is where I'm going with this. You have an opportunity to do something. You talk a good line when you can, and then when you can, you don't. So it's extremely disappointing. I want to also talk to code enforcement, because that came up. Great point. When I've called code enforcement, I'm not shy. I have no problem when I see something. They ask name, rank, and serial number. Someone who's in a very vulnerable position isn't going to be able to do that. They can't give their name, so they're not going to call things in. 
This is kind of common sense stuff. Most of us are very privileged in our lives. You know, I, I grew up in that very unprivileged situation. I'm at a different time in my life. And I've done things to get where I'm at. I kind of wrote that in an email to you guys today. But I grew up in that situation. And, and you know, we have one council member sitting here that I'm aware of that really understands that life today. And that's Council Member Campos. And that's why she always speaks up for her constituents, Mr. Graham. And I watched that one video where you kind of were lecturing her on the net zero on maybe she, how business is run. She always stands up for her constituents, the most vulnerable people. So that should be no surprise to anybody. But very disappointed. For those tenants who are really suffering, you can do something now. And, and this has gone on too long. So enjoy your night. Our next speaker is Spencer Doran, followed by Devonica. Thank you, Derek. Good evening, Mayor, Council, VPD, Translation. Appreciate you in the back. Mayor, did you miss me? Been a long time. One comment today. Just for you, sir. Uh, I want to get into um, this deep discussion today, but more importantly, I go into the fluidity of our community being involved in the relationship we continue to have with our school district. It's very, very powerful and important, and to the point where there was a school board meeting tonight, the first one in a couple of weeks, and when we moved our schedule from Mondays to Tuesday, I think the biggest discrepancy that wasn't caught, even though I mentioned the public comment, it's the same night as our school board meetings. This is super valuable. You know, tonight there was over 50 residents speaking on behalf of the Washington School property. A teacher named Mr. Doug Kibble went around knocking on doors, passing out letters, and all were in complete favor of keeping it historic and keeping the open space from what I saw and heard in testimony tonight at school board. And I wish some of the council members could have been there. I think it would have been very powerful and understanding to see Mayor that's currently your district, where the Washington School property is. And just Really just a fluid motion between the schools and, right? Because how can you be a both? I think I'm the only one making public comment. I thought maybe Christy Weir might pop in tonight. But it was really, really important for us to give a seat tonight on the agenda. I saw something else today. What was it? Uh, something about the schools. It wasn't resource officers. You know, I'm going to use my time to show the importance of a school relationship because it comes out so much. Reimbursement agreement between the Church of School District and the City of Ventura Grand Crossing Guard for the fiscal year 2025. And the city doesn't know the difference. I said the same comment, very similar at the school district. 95% of residents don't know the difference between the county land, the city land, the school district land. Why are the fences locked? Why are they open? What's happening? And even furthermore, there's going to be meetings happening all the time. I just found out tonight there's a 7 Eleven committee meeting. We all know what that committee is. It was created by the school district to talk about selling of surplus land. And in that land is, was eventually like 20 properties. It went down to seven. And now it's about five main properties looking to sell. Avenue School being one of them, the Stanley property, Washington School property, and also two uh, landlocked uh, agricultural properties. I would love for a council member to please be at the subcommittee at 7-Eleven on Thursday, I believe at 3 p.m. Be very valuable. Something that I wanted to bring up. Also, along those notes, it uh, came up where solar is going across all of our school districts. And would you believe, Councilmember Duran, that they thought about putting solar panels above the yard in the quad at Ventura High School? Interesting topic. Maybe one of our council members who went to Ventura High School or Buena like to weigh in on that type of stuff because there's no current board members that went to Ventura High or even graduated from the district. A few notes of the importance of relationship with the school district and the city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nirvanika. You should always have a cone for construction safety. Okay, as a construction worker, I've noticed some things that need to be reconstructed in this town. And, uh, and there are some organizations in this town that absolutely definitely need to be demoed. And um, 
I'd like to talk about the reconstruction of this town because we got some got some missing uh, uh, wheelchair ramps that that have disappeared, and and I heard some things. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard some people didn't like them because they didn't like it. They said they looked ugly or something. But the beauty, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. To some people, a wheelchair ramp might look ugly. But to somebody that's in a wheelchair, a, a wheelchair ramp is a thing of beauty. And to somebody that's disabled and, and, and has a problem, you know, getting back and forth to work out here as a musician, has to push things in cars. A wheelchair ramp is a thing of beauty. And I heard that somebody took all those wheelchair ramps, took a chainsaw, and butchered them up. I don't think that's too nice. I don't think that's too nice. So, so I think we can reconstruct these uh, wheelchair ramps and anchor them into the concrete. That's what we ought to do. And so, and I forgot to say, peace and love to everyone and everything, everywhere. Meeting adjourned.